first thing is to review and approve the agenda. I don't think there are any changes to be made. Any objection to that? Nope. Nope. Okay. So without objection, we will consider the agenda approved. Uh, the next thing is uh, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to, or council, I suppose, uh, to address the council on any matter uh, otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would keep your comments to about two minutes and um, say your name and where you're from. Yeah. So if anyone has anything they want to say, now is the time. Cameron, do you see anybody? No. Okay. A very excited dog in the background. Very excited. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome. Um, okay. Uh, I think we are, unless anyone wants to jump in, I am going to move on. Uh, okay, so the next uh, piece is the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I'll make a motion that we accept the consent agenda. I'll second it. Okay, any further discussion? Um, I just, um, I don't need to pull an item to delay, you know, to not vote on it, but I'm wondering, uh, Bill or Cameron, if either you can tell us about the Park Mobile um, app, because that seems like kind of a big deal. Yeah, and uh, we talked about that a little bit, I think, when we had our parking discussion. This is a strategy that we hope to be including perhaps within a month or so once we've signed this contract so people will be able to pay uh, for parking via a mobile app through their phone uh, so they won't need cash or a credit card on their person. There is a service charge uh, attached to that. That's how Park Mobile makes its money. It doesn't cost the city. Um, so we're hoping, you know, there's for anyone that's used it before, there are stickers that are on um, the, the meter. So we obviously like to get those all in and affixed before it gets too cold. So we're pushing to have that done as soon as possible. The other key factor with this is that, um, you know, we've talked about the limited lifespan of our current meters and the need to upgrade them given that they're 2G meters and they're being phased out. But in our financial situation right now, we really don't have the, the capacity to buy new meters. So um, our plan is if, if the, if the 2G system runs out, basically the credit card option would go away, but people could still pay with coins and could use this app instead uh, as a convenience app. So there still would be two means of doing that. You know, obviously we need to replace our meters at some point and as soon as we can financially, but now is not the time. So. Fair enough. Uh, thanks for that. Um, and so there's a motion and a, and a second. Any further discussion on this? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so the consent agenda passes and uh, we are good to move on uh, to the social and economic justice uh, appointments. So for that um, committee, uh, there I think there are actually seven uh, positions either vacant or up for appointment. And I think we had five applicants. Uh, so I don't see any of them on here. I did get a message from Michael Sherman, which I forwarded to you all saying that he was interested in continuing to serve, but would not likely make the meeting. Um, is I suppose if we just, I know we have a couple appointments to make, but perhaps we can just take them one at a time. Um, is there a, um, any discussion or motion regarding, uh, yes, Jack, go ahead. I move that we go into executive session to consider uh, the appointment of a public official. I'll second it. Okay. Um, and just double checking here. Oh, because we do have somebody on the line. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, are any of the members from or up for appointment for the Social and Economic Justice 
committee uh, want to speak? No one from the committee is here. Okay, um, so we have a motion and a second. Oh, uh, Lauren, go ahead. I was wondering if we should ask if anyone from the design review committee is here too, because if we go into executive session, if we could do it all at once, that would make the most sense. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, Jay, did you have something you want to say? Okay. Um, all right. So let's look at the um, design review committee as well then. Um, so I'm actually going to get back there. Okay. So for the design review committee, um, I we had four uh, positions uh, open. I think we had two uh, applicants, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I don't see either of them on the line either. Um, so, uh, Jack and Donna, uh, is, uh, your motion's about considering, um, appointments for city officials and uh, your, uh, just to be clear, it's to talk about the appointments of both of these committees. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, uh before you go, Madam Mayor, before you go into executive session, how are phone-in participants supposed to know when you come out? Uh, we'll so still be here. And so with this- Say it again? This Zoom isn't going anywhere. So this Zoom will still no, be- No, but I'm not, I'm not in Zoom. I'm just on a phone. Right, but you're still talking to the Zoom platform. So we'll still be here. And okay, just hold, hold in the queue yep. and you'll go into yep. a different meeting. Okay. That is correct. Thanks. Yep. So we will be back shortly, um, back in this same same call, same Zoom. Um, all right. So uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. And none opposed. So um, we're gonna ahead to the other call to the to the executive session call and we will be back soon okay the executive session so moved second all in favor please say aye aye, aye. and opposed okay so we are back in regular session is there a motion i, yeah, move, ahead, Jack. I move that to the social and economic justice committee we appoint lalita mawaganam michael sherman shana casper Julia Chaffetz and Janelle Perry, and to the Design Review Committee, we appoint <coughs> Eric Gilbertson and Stephen Everett. Second. Okay, so motion and a second. Any um, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, ever, uh, yes, Donna. I just want to make the comment that I really appreciate the way Cameron lined up all the applicants within the a link agenda. It was very helpful. Thank you. Is she here, Cameron? Did you get yes. My... Yes, she is. Yeah. Um, yes, and uh, thank you to all the applicants. Thank you for your service, uh, and your time, and your dedication. Uh, all right, so we are going to move on to the update from MIAC, and I think. I saw, oh, there's Kate. Uh, hello. Hello. I'm just going to turn it right over to you to give us a, an update. Okay, great. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kate Stevenson, and I am a member of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Um, I recently stepped down as chair and handed it over to Amy Gamble, um, but um, wanted to do this update because um, Basically, what I'd like to present to you today is kind of an update on the municipal energy tracking work that we've been doing and um, talk a little bit about some of our recent projects with the Energy Advisory Committee and kind of where we're going. So um, for those of you who are new to the council, you know, the Ad Energy Advisory Committee is exactly that. It's our job is to just advise city council on energy related issues for the city, um, but we also kind of tended to do projects above and beyond that as well related to community outreach and education. Um, but for today's um, overview that I wanna give, we are just gonna specifically talk about uh, municipal energy use, um, which is defined basically as like 
the city owned buildings, uh, fleet and operations. So uh, and we, uh, for these purposes are including the school district and the, the school buildings as well. So we've got a few slides for you to just kind of show you a little bit what we've been working on. Um, so let me just open this up. Everybody see the, the graph? Okay. Um, yeah. So great. Just to start out, um, we've now been tracking municipal energy use for nine years and uh, just finished we're kind of always about a year behind in, in getting all the numbers updated. So we just finished updating everything with fiscal year 19, uh, which closed July 2019. Um, and then we're starting to work on uh, fiscal year 20. And um, uh, Kelly Murphy, the new finance director, has been, I've met with her a couple times to, to talk through this process. And, um, you know, it's a lot of work just to gather all the data from all the different city departments and the uh, Green Mountain Power and all the different um, places, but um, it's it's worth keeping on top of it, I guess. <laughs> so so now that we have nine years of data, you know some of these graphs might look familiar. They just have an extra year added on. A couple big big picture things that I want to, want you to be aware of is you know like I said, we're kind of looking at three big buckets: um, thermal heating, um, electricity use, and then our fleet. Uh, so in this one, you can kind of see how those are changing. And with the exception of you'll see a little blip in 2014, that's mainly um, when district heat came online, there was like a big increase in oil that year, um, but then it kind of went back down again. So that's why there's a little peak in 2014. But over net zero by 2030. Um, and, but we still have a ways to go and fuel use because that's what we're really, our goal is about being 100% off of fossil fuels. So when we look at where we're using fossil fuels now and break it down into these, um, you know, building particularly, um, the, the, we have some really good news, <laughs> which I'm excited about um, when we look at this graph. So um, basically, you know, you look at two of the big chunks, the district heat utility, um, which is when we burn heating oil to run the district heat in the summertime, um, and the water resource recovery facility. Those are two huge users of heating, heating oil. And we are, have projects, you know, basically completed or underway to eliminate, um, a large percentage of the heating oil use in those two facilities. So um, when we look at this graph a couple years from now, we're gonna see <laughs> those two disappear. And the same with um, Union Elementary is actually on district heat and they did buy a bunch of oil for their backup um, and burn some oil in FY19, but they're not planning on running on oil going forward. Um, so that was also kind of a, uh, hopefully one time, um, thing where they went back to, to buying oil. But it really, the other thing, you know, if you take those three chunks of the pie out, it really helps us focus down on where we need to look over the next 10 years to continue to reduce our fossil fuel use. So the places um, to really focus are gonna be the high school, the middle school, the water plant, and then to a lesser extent, the DPW facilities at Dog River, um, and then Rec, the rec center, kind of a big unknown, I think at this point, what happens with the rec center, but it is burning a bunch of oil right now. So anyway, I think, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about, <laughs> about the fact that we've, we've really made some great progress in, in reducing the fossil fuel use and, and we're headed in the right direction here. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the revolving loan fund, the net zero revolving loan fund. Um, this was, established in 2016 by city council. Um, we, the city put in $20,000 from a reserve fund into this special fund, and it's to be used for energy efficiency projects on municipal buildings. Um, so some of the recent projects, it took, you know, we started this in 2016. It took us a while to complete some audits and like get some projects lined up. So it was really 
2019 and 2020 when we've started to actually get projects checked off of our to-do list. Um, so that included insulating the district heat pipes to the fire station, uh, replacing part of the controls on the snow melt system, which basic, uh, you know, melts all the snow in front of the, the fire trucks outside on the sidewalk. Um, we did a small project to replace storm windows in the DPW building. Um, we did some lighting upgrades in City Hall, a big project to weather strip um, over 150 windows in City Hall, um, which is still getting wrapped up. So that one hasn't gotten fully checked off yet. But um, And then we went through and we went through and did weather stripping on all of the overhead doors, which were spread around in all the different municipal buildings. So those are some of the projects that we've been working on. And I want to give a big shout out to Steve Twombly, who is our, um, I think, authorized to spend one day a week helping us <laughs> um, kind of project manage these projects. Um, so he, he was really the one uh, coordinating with all the subcontractors and um, moving these things forward. So if we kind of look at, well, what's the impact been of the revolving loan fund over the last few years? Um, there's two different graphs that come out of the tracking software that we use to uh, measure all of our projects. But um, we, with the fully completed projects, we've spent over $16,000. Um, and we're seeing out of those projects annual cost savings of over $12,000. So we've already um, achieved total cost savings of over $21,000 over the, the couple of years that this has been going. And um, you know, significant energy savings, emission savings. Um, it's really, I think, we, we finally have enough projects completed to really start to see the impact of this. Um, and the way that the fund is set up is that the, um, the savings all go back into the fund, but then for two years after that, we get 50% of the savings built into the fund. And so we're slowly going to be able to build it up over time. Um, but right now, we, um, we don't have an, a lot of projects going because we're kind of waiting for savings to accrue back in and you know, trying, to, trying to identify what the best next projects are going to be. So there is a revolving loan fund committee that is made up of members of MEAC as well as city staff um, that reviews any potential projects. And we haven't met in a while, so probably due to get back together and think about what projects we might want to queue up for 2021. So a couple, this is a couple of just snapshots of uh, good news, because we can all use some more good news these days. Um, so the big news with the district heat is that they um, were able to shut down the summer loop this year um, and not run the city hall boilers for domestic hot water in the summer. Um, this is something we've been trying to work towards for years and we're super excited that, that this happened. Um, so there's still, I, um, I don't know what the full plan is of whether, the, you know, whether this is kind of a permanent change um, whether it still needs to be turned on in the spring and fall for some shoulder season heating. But um, if it was shut down entirely, it would save about 15,000 gallons of oil every year. Um, but in terms of kind of going forward, um, our committee is, would really encourage the city to do an analysis of the district heat um, system. It's been five years in operation now, so we have some data for there is data out there about the costs and the energy use, um, but we, yeah, someone needs to collect it all and kind of do some analysis. So um, we can, we would be happy to help out as a committee, but we don't have access to any of that data right now. Um, but just think that that is an important next step um, to be able to think about what this looks like going forward. Um, Quick, you know, note on the municipal solar. Um, we are we are offsetting about forty four percent of our electricity use for the city and the school district combined um, with our solar array. We have two different arrays. One is down in Sharon, and then part of it is here in Montpelier off of Love Road. Um, and 
you know, there, in a lot of ways we can sit back and just let it do its thing. <laughs> but one of the interesting things about this year is that it's actually been a very sunny year. Um, so our solar production is way up um, and our electric use is way down because of COVID. A lot of the buildings that were shut down um, in the spring and or just changing changes in use have meant that the demand for electricity has gone down over the last few months. So we've actually been, um, Kelly Murphy and I have been working with the um, Novus, which is the, the solar developer, to start to allocate our solar credits to more different meters. So basically we started out where we took all the solar credits and we were just putting them, throwing them at the wastewater treatment plant at the highest using uh, buildings. But now that we have more credits, we need to kind of spread them out more. So that's in process. Um, and the other thing I just want to flag is that at some point in the next couple of years, um, the city council will need to make a decision about, uh, we have an option to buy out the solar array at year seven in our contract. Um, and I don't know exactly what year, I think we're in year four. So we've got a couple years to figure this out, but um, hopefully MIAC can help and do some analysis of the cost benefit, whether that makes sense. Um, whether we would want to continue with our power purchase agreement or um, the other option would potentially be to kind of to bond, to buy it out, and there, there could be potential savings with that. But we haven't done all the back. Another uh, good news story is about at the police station, um, and this is specifically about electric use. Um, so at the end of or kind of early 2019, the, um, the whole air conditioning system was replaced. So they took off the big chillers on the roof that were um, about 20 years old and put in uh, air, to air source heat pumps throughout the building. Um, and they don't actually use them for heating because they're on district heat, but they use them for cooling in the summer. So you can see um, this is just a snapshot of the electric use. It went way up in the summer. You can see these kind of um, bumps up in the summer. And then we installed the heat pumps last summer. There was, you know, flat line. Um, so 26% reduction in electric use from one year to the next, um, which I think we can attribute directly to the heat pumps. Um, so that was, a, that was a big project. The act didn't really have much to do with it, but we're glad that it happened. Um, and, you know, the biggest project that is ongoing is the wastewater treatment plant. Um, I was able to get a few updates from, from Kurt and um, the folks at ESG last week um, just to kind of make sure that I was up to speed as to where things are. But they are projecting to complete phase one um, in December for the end of the year. Um, and then phase two, which involves the um, combined heat and power generator that will burn the biogas and produce electricity and heat. Um, that's projected to come online May 2022, um, so that it's still a few years out. It'll give them time to kind of ramp up the biogas production. But um, the amount of electricity that they are projecting to produce is really substantial, and I just want to make sure everyone understands that it's twice as much as our solar array, right? So um, 1.5 million kilowatt hours. Um, a year from, from our solar project, this is 3 million kilowatt hours a year. Um, so it is a whole lot of electricity. Um, and we are actually going to be selling it to Green Mountain Power for like the highest rate possible. So it's 20.7 cents per kilowatt hour. It's a great rate. It's because they want renewably produced electricity and we get the highest tier in the standard offered program. Um, so the electricity produced is not going to count towards our net zero goal because we are selling it on the open market. Um, so that's just that's one thing to be aware of. Um, but they are expecting that the revenue from the electricity sales is going to be an additional eighty thousand dollars a year, over, above and beyond any end, because they were able to get a bunch of grant about $5 million of grants, um, we don't have to go and ask for more money for phase two. Like they already have, they have the funding for phase two. So that's also really exciting. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think it, it, 
does really change the profile of all of our energy tracking. So this is what I've been doing a lot of head scratching over the last couple of weeks. Next 10 years look like, how do we reach our net zero goal? So this is my, my presentation. It's our energy use to date. The dotted red line shows you know, what we've tracked so far and more of these a reduction in oil use like from the district heat summer loop. Um, we're talking about reduced oil use at the wastewater treatment plant. But I think we, but then you see this big spike because it, to bring in all the organic waste into the wastewater treatment plant, it requires a lot of energy <laughs> to keep that warm, to heat it. So it will all be renewable energy. It will be biogas that's used to do it. But it actually, like, um, our total energy load will go up. So it's kind of this, um, it's a little hard to wrap my head around, I know, <laughs> um, because we're kind of taking external, what are currently externalities, there are things that are happening outside of the city of Montpelier and we are bringing them in, we are treating that waste, we are harnessing that waste to produce energy. Um, but by doing that, we are also increasing our energy use and increasing our um, emissions here in within the city limits of Montpelier. Um, so I think this is something I, I certainly want to work on more and kind of trying to figure out how to um, you know, dial in our projections and, and we only have, we have less than 10 years now to reach our goal. Um, and we don't have a, you know, I can, aside from all of the, the good news stories that I've told you, we don't have a plan yet for how we're going to reduce the rest of our, you know, eliminate the rest of our fossil fuel use. A big chunk of that has to do with our, our vehicle fleet and it has to do with fuel switching at those buildings that I mentioned are still that are still on fossil fuel. Um, so, you know, when this topic of the net zero 2030 plan originally went on the agenda, I think we were hoping that at that point, um, you know, a year ago, we were we had applied for a grant to hire a consultant to help us work through this plan. We didn't get the grant. Um, and so we haven't made any progress on our 2030 plan. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, I think kind of as I, to wrap up, I think that's the question that's a little bit on the table. It may not be um, open for like a lot of discussion tonight, but it's to figure out how can the city continue to move this forward? Um, you know, there's only limited capacity within the volunteers um, on MIAC to take on what is a su substantial project. So. Um, we need to kind of reevaluate how we can uh, keep this moving forward. But I'm happy to take questions and I'll stop the share and we can see if anybody has any questions. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Bill. I actually just wanted to throw on three comments to Kate's before we open up questions. Number one, um, just to say to Kate and to everyone else that we've already reached out to. Um, Evergreen Energy, who was our original consultant on the district heat project, to do an analysis or giving them some information so they can provide us a proposal. And we'd love to have MIAC included in that because um, we're looking for all sorts of suggestions from them. So, yes, we agree. It's time. And uh, secondly, uh, just when we're talking about the waste, uh, the water resource recovery facility, I, I really do want to shout out to MIAC for their leadership on that and also to Kurt Modica in particular for really uh, going above and beyond as a city employee to get the grants and the loans and to help work on the getting the pricing from uh, Green Mountain Power, uh, all great job, but uh, certainly in here. And then finally on, on net zero, I, I appreciated Kate bringing that up. I just would remind the council and MIAC that we, we because we didn't get the grant last year, we do have $35,000 in the present budget, I mean, we don't have any money, period, but uh, assuming we have some money, um, we have $35,000, so um, we could, you know, initiate that project for whatever that will buy, and, um, you know, maybe it's a two-year project. So uh, we look forward to whatever you think, Kate, that the group can do with that, but uh, because the council did fund it this year. So those are my three areas of comment, and then I'll um, Other questions or comments for Kate? Yeah, go ahead, Donna. I just, as always, Kate, you present 
wonderful statistics, data, graphs, all readable, understandable. Uh, really, really helps me. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And all your committee members too, all your work that you do steadily is very much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. Jay. Um, yes, I'll, I'll agree with that. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, and sorry for if this is something of an uninformed question, but I'm trying to help me understand the relationship that the city has with the school district, because obviously the high school um, and the middle school are, you know, two big pieces of the pie. So are we working together with them? Um, I understand that, you know, in terms of ownership and et cetera, but management, um, I just want to have a better understanding of how that's all happening. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question, Jay, because um, I would say historically there hasn't been a lot of communication between MIAC and the school district. Um, we have one member, Ken Jones, who is a longtime school board member. Um, so he has kind of been our liaison of sorts between the school board and, um, and our committee. And so last year, I think it was last year, maybe it was longer than a year ago, um, when they brought on a new facilities director, we went and um, met with him. And then we, Ken and I actually went and made a presentation to the school board, um, I guess last summer. <laughs> it's hard to remember, but um, to try and reach out. And I think um, one of the initial things that we were asking for is what, basically to ask the school district to adopt the same net zero 2030 goal that the city has adopted. Um, I, as far as I know, no action has been taken on that, um, but that would be one small step, I think, um, to, to start to collaborate with the school district. Um, and I do think that there is opportunity for, um, we can really lean on Efficiency Vermont and their services for retro commissioning the, the, all the schools, um, which is basically kind of like an engineer's deep dive into the heating and ventilation systems um, to make sure that they're operating properly. So that is kind of what was our recommendation to the, the school's facilities director. And I don't, haven't heard whether any action has been taken on that. That's kind of the next step. Uh, go ahead, Lauren. Um, first of all, just thank you so much. Like, totally agree. Great information. And I, I think it's very exciting and impressive how much work uh, MIAC has gotten done. So kudos to all the team. I know a lot of people put a lot of effort into those projects and so thank you for all of that. Um, definitely want to like follow up on the net zero planning and, you know, maybe this is something I know MIAC is doing some kind of like planning meetings over the next month or so. So thinking about, you know, if we have less resources than we thought, does it make sense to do a deep dive into one of the sectors um, or, you know, some other approach. So, you know, definitely want to close the loop on that and figure out how we move forward and, and get some, you know, have that plan in place, knowing, as you said, that the clock is ticking to really get to the, the 2030 goals and things that I'm sure will take time to put in place. Um, so looking forward to that and hope we can keep this on our agenda in the coming weeks. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to mention was the, um, well, well, one thing you brought up, the, uh, the school and the ventilation. I know that the school kind of tied in with the COVID stuff. Um, the facilities director, at least at Union Elementary, has been working with Efficiency Vermont on a big ventilation project. So I don't know if that, they might have had different goals <laughs> than what you described, um, but but I know that there has been work and they've been getting grants and some other things. So there might be some progress there to, to check in on. Um, and um, other thing wanted to note, today the Vermont House passed um, the Global Warming Solutions Act, resoundingly, yeah. uh, 102 to 45. Um, so there's still, you know, the governor's process and what happens after that. Um, so some hoops to jump through, but, um, if that does go into a place that is setting targets for the state that we will have to hit by 2025, um, a 26% reduction in, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and ratchets up from there. Um, and that sets up a climate council and planning process. Um, so just thinking about how the city could plug into that council and planning and, you know, being a place for 
innovation and collaboration and you know we've been doing this a lot and with the micro transit project and other things just you know where could we pilot good ideas you know and or there could be more um you know obviously there's going to be tough budget times but with this commitment that the legislature is making you know possibly resources for programs and other things um to actually hit those goals so just noting that for people so obviously we can kind of keep um keep that in mind and be participating in that as a city, I hope to, um, to make the most of it and figure out where we could be kind of a place we could model things and um, put into practice to help meet our own net zero goals. That's all. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? I have a comment, Matt, Mayor. Uh, go ahead there, Stephen. Uh, I, I just in the sense that the revolving loan fund might have available funds. I know that later in the agenda, the discussion of moving back into city council chambers, I think some heat recovery ventilation for that council room will exhaust the potentially contaminated air and recover the heat as it brings in fresh air. It may be a timely project for use. Uh, it, it is an energy efficiency uh, model. So I, I just suggest that. And if you could find a way to capture uh, revenue off the sewer gas coming out at state and Maine, uh, that would be valuable too. Great, thank you. Uh, interesting projects to consider. Um, any other uh, comments from our council or the public? Um, Kate, I am so grateful um, for you and, and your work with the, uh, the committee. Um, I am uh, just curious as to, uh, I mean, I know you've put in a lot of time and, and Kelly has put in a lot of time into putting these numbers together. Um, and uh, so I, I guess I'm, I'm curious as to like, you know, uh, how, how doable is putting these numbers together um, I, like, I, I, you know, I'm so grateful for you, but, you know, if, if you were to decide, okay, I'm going to do something else, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do this again next year, um, you know, is Kelly going to be able to do it, or how easy would it be for someone to, to step in and run, run these numbers for us? Um, I, I will say we haven't su fully successfully made a transition to having it done by city staff, um, partly because Todd left and Kelly was coming in and, um, you know what I also what I didn't present to you what I was all the the greenhouse gas emissions part of this um, because I haven't had the time to work on those numbers and the conversions and all of that so there is a lot more work to be done um, you know it yeah I think we should have an energy coordinator um, position but um, and this would this would be a big piece of what I would expect they could work on. But um, right now, yeah, it's, it is a lot of time and it's a lot of chasing things down. And uh, I don't know that there is a, we now have like a good place to store all of our data, um, but you still have to collect it from a dozen different places. So um, yeah, there's room for improvement there. And if I get hit by a bus, I don't know who's going to pick it up and run with it. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Donna, did you have a... Uh, on that point, Mayor, uh, maybe we should send her some chocolate or flowers just to keep her really motivated. <laughs> yeah, right? We're so grateful. I'm so grateful. Um, yeah, and, and I, I do feel like if we're going to continue to make progress and, and, you know, not necessarily even just for uh, municipal operations, uh, as we're starting to solve you know, bigger, uh, big chunks of uh, our fossil fuel usage um, within the city, which is really encouraging. If I recall from your first slide, we're at, or a second, um, we're at about 40% renewable right now, which that's remarkable. That is amazing. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think we, uh, I mean, we have a 2050 goal for the whole community and, you know, that's going to, you know, we, we need to start working on that if we're going to, if that's going to be realistic. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. So thank you again for, for all your work and, uh, I'm, we're going to continue to chip away at this. So any other comments from the council or the public? 
Okay. All right. Thanks again, Kate. Thanks for a great Thanks, Kate. Okay. All right. Um, so next up is the personnel plan. Um, this has uh, been on our on the council's radar anyway for uh, a couple of years now, I think, or maybe just a year ballpark. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Bill to talk about. Thank you. And I believe Tanya Chambers, our HR manager, is on the call as well. Um, so our, th this is really just an update of uh, an overhaul of the personnel policy, personnel plan, as we call it. Um, the last one, the last one was overhauled and adopted was in 2007. And over the years, as things have come up, we've realized needs to update it, change it, modernize it, and make it reflect. And through a variety of fits and starts, uh, we didn't really get good momentum and, you know, other things got in the way. Uh, but I think a year or so ago, we engaged a really active group of city employees from all departments, uh, you know, non-union. This is for primarily for non-union employees. And um, they really, we just went through it uh, from top to bottom, got almost done, a couple of personnel changes, a couple of things came up. Then COVID hit, but we finally managed to get really uh, from the beginning to the end with all the changes and then circulated them all around to the interested parties a number of times, got feedback changes. I really tried to be as thorough as we can, have as much employee involvement as we can, and also to uh, reflect our current standards and values. And this is really it. Um, the reason the document is not in strikeout is that we made so many changes that it was really, it became easier for us to work off a clean document than strike out. So I think it would have been hard to read, but um, Cameron did a really nice job putting together a summary of the changes. I think those really hit. There aren't a huge amount of really substantive, substantive changes, just clarifying policies, making sure things represent the way we actually do things, making sure it uses more modern language, making sure it reflects things. So we're I think as a whole, we're very happy with this. We're happy to have reached this point uh, where we present it to you for approval and we certainly um, hope that you'll approve it. And we're happy to answer any questions. Great, any questions about the policy? Jack. Thanks. Um, Bill, I was <clears throat> could, uh, thinking about uh, section 15, the. Uh, workers' comp section or work-related injury leave. Um, could you explain how that uh, works the way it's now uh, proposed? Fortunately, I can see that Tanya has already unmuted herself. <laughs> I'm hoping that yes, she can... Yes, of course. I, I would share my video, but my bandwidth here would make it impossible for you to hear or see me, so I apologize for that. Um, what I did with updating the workers' comp section was to provide very specific procedure for employees, um, how quickly they need to report an injury, who they need to report it to, and then what to do with that information once it's reported. Thanks. The, the question I was really wondering about is the city will continue to pay the injured worker by way of the injured worker's leave time, and then the, comp the city would be reimbursed. Is that uh, a way of... Yeah, so for clarity... Delays? Yeah, for clarity, that is what we already do. And I think the way it read before was that we would pay the difference um, of the workers' comp benefit and their average weekly wage. Um, but we do that really um, for clarity by using their sick leave and we continue to pay them on a biweekly basis of 80 hours using their sick leave. And when their workers comp check comes in, they sign it over to us and we reimburse their sick leave back at 60%. So it's, it's, we, it's doing the same thing by giving them 100% of their regular pay, but it was clarity on how we do it, which is the way we've always done it. Just didn't exactly reflect the way uh, we do it based on the way it read. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tanya. Other questions? Uh, Connor, and then uh, Dan, and then Don. I, well, I, I just wanted to say, I know I've been a thorn on this one, but um, just want to thank Bill and Tanya and everybody who worked on it. 
I think like, yeah, if you don't have a union contract, this is an extremely compassionate uh, personnel plan here, just explicitly spelling out just cause protection, things like that. Um, you know, or things other public workers don't have in other places. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit more. The one, one piece I feel a little uncomfortable about that was added uh, was um, the credit check piece for certain employees. Um, I know that is a way that you can look to see if there's a history of embezzlement or something, but, you know, there have been movements against having credit checks for new hires, you know. Bad credit can be a sign of, like, previous unemployment. It can be, you know, medical debt. Uh, usually you have children. It disproportionately impacts people of color. Um, so, yeah, I think I'd like to just hear a little bit more about that. I could maybe see, like, very specific positions, like, you know, finance director or something. And but I don't think that is it be broader than that or interpreted as broader than that. So I'd like the language really tight on it or something. Tanya, did you yeah, want that's to go? very fair. I think um, it is only we only do that for finance positions. So I think it's fair to tighten that up and identify that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, it's definitely not something that's broad, broadly done, except for people that are going to be directly working with money and managing, you know, that is a potential for fraud risk. Um, and I think we just put it in because because we do it. We didn't want to exclude it and then have someone say, you know, you never said you could do it. But I think I certainly have any, you know, issue if you wanted to approve this with the condition that we amend it to include finance, financial positions only. That would be, that's, all, that's all we do. That, that would be okay, Connor? Okay. That, that's good. So I was thinking, like, okay, do we need to, like, hammer out language, but if it's just with a condition that it, you know, supplies to financial positions, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. Um, but when you say finance positions, you don't just simply mean the finance department. It would be any department that handled money oh, okay. or any position, right? Bill? Yeah, I mean, more specifically, it would be the finance director, the staff accountant, the senior staff accountant, somebody who's um, probably the... Um, the clerk uh, or the treasurer rather, um, if we were to hire a new treasurer. So it would be for the positions that specifically handle money. Okay. Um, I had a question about the social media review, um, just because I didn't see any, any details as to how that social media, and it's in the same section about, it, uh, about hiring, um, one, what kind of social media review is being proposed or is, is being practiced right now? And two is, you know, what, what kind of standard are you looking for in, in using that type of review and hiring process? I'm wondering if Cameron, um, if you could answer that better than I could. Yeah, I can jump in though. I think, um, again, it depends on the position, right? So um, for some, there'd be almost none. Or virtually none for positions that are going to represent, you know, say a department head position or, you know, city manager's office or something like that. Um, we, we will look at whatever public social media, you know, Google it. and some of it, quite frankly, my thought on that is um, the rest of the public has access to that, the press and everybody else. Um, I want to be able to see, what's there before anybody else does to understand if there's anything I need, you know, should ask about or be concerned about, or if this is just not a purpose person who represents themselves in a way that, you know, would, would work well with the city. So it's part of, you know, unfortunately, it's just part of the public profile is, you know, it's, it's a kind of a way of checking references. Uh, but we don't do that with say, you know, I don't believe, I shouldn't say this absolutely, but I don't believe we do this with DPW employees or, you know, those kind of things. It's really positions that are going to be in the public eye. Okay. But this, oh, go ahead, Cameron. Sorry, I was just going to add another layer of discussion about that is that we do have, um, you know, an internal social media policy that, that this sort of aligns with just saying in there that, you know, you, you can't um, be um, saying things on online that are like spamming or like, um, something that could be constituted as threats or hate speech. Those are things that we'd be looking for just in general, things that don't align with our um, 
city values that we've established um, internally as staff. And is this something where, you know, you're just looking for what's publicly available in social media? Yes. You're not asking applicants to give you, to either friend you or to reveal private no. um, accounts? Okay. No, no one we has are to that you can legally do that. <laughs> yeah, I, that's where I was, I wanted to make sure we... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Yeah, and obviously that that all comes with the difference, Cameron, between like you know somebody who's doing something that might be considered against our social media policy, sort of hate speech, versus just simply expressing political opinions that might not be popular, you know, with others. Um, and so you're really looking for that kind of that that more extreme. Where, where somebody really has an issue um, that would create an issue for the city once they became a representative of the city. That's fair enough. Okay, thanks. And again, it's something we've been doing and we felt it was important to write it down so that it was there, people right there for all to see. Um, Donna and then Connor. Okay, uh, thank you. I was interested also in the social media presence and you answered that question, but back to the policy. I didn't see a policy statement here. Did I miss it? Is it in the personnel or is it a separate policy? That Cameron referred? The social media policy is a separate document. I apologize that you um, didn't get it and we'll make sure that we get a copy out. I do wanna mention too that we did have an attorney review the social media policy for legality um, so we were very careful with our language. It'd be, it'd be helpful to know, and I appreciate you having it. I think it's important that we do it, but you want to, you know, do it right. Uh, so other, other questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, just small things like you talk about professional development. Do employees come back? Do they do a report? Do they share with other people what they learn? So there's sort of a ripple effect of their training. Um, so all of the above, it depends on the training rate. So some we send people so they can come back and then specifically train other people. Others, they provide a report of what they've done. Others, it's so that they could go back and be better at specifically what they're doing. It might be something more specific. So, uh, you know, we, when, when someone goes to training, we try to identify what the, what the outcome, what the goal is. Um, so it's you know, case it, by case. Right. It's, can, you know, really depends on what the skill is, right? So say, I'm going to simplify this, but we've done this in the past. Say we've had people that just weren't good writers and it was important to be able to write. So we'd send them to a writing class. Well, you we don't really expect them necessarily to make everyone else a good writer. The, the, the idea was to improve their writing for their job. performance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then I guess you'd incorporate it to encourage them that indeed you see results, right? I mean, you have to use it as well as they have to use it. Great. Um, a question about the accumulated somewhat is the term for both your sick time and your vacation time. Vacation time is capped at 35, I think 35 days? Per year. Per year. So, so that means I can't earn any more than that or I can't accrue any more of that by not using it. You can't earn any more than that in a year, but you can accrue and there's a cap on the accrual. Um, I'm just kind of... It's uh, based on the years of service. Right. The cap uh, on the accrual is based on years of service. Uh, but mm -hmm. for somebody who is um, a city employee for 14 years or more are capped at 320 vacation hours. Right now, but when they, let's say, I mean, one of the, I, one of the things that happen is some of our employees didn't use their vacation time and they accrued a lot. So I was also looking at just what was the max of the accrual and I didn't see it in here, but maybe it's separate. I can get that from Bill. That's true. Um, I believe it is in there. Okay. So you have to use it or you lose it kind of situation. Well, so. Up to a certain, uh, uh, not the max. Right. Up to the max. You can accrue and roll every year up to the maximum based on your years of service. Oh, okay. So I could end the year with all 35 days saved? Oh, and then Yes. And then the next year, I couldn't have more than 35 days left. 
Is that right? So with the, the maximum of 35 days is the maximum amount of hours per month that you accrue based on years of service. So uh, somebody who uh, just starts earns eight hours a month. I, I, and I then after seven years, sorry. No, no, I, I really, you, you explained that earlier. I really did understand your point about the difference on what they accrue dealing with how many years are there. But no matter what they accrue on a monthly basis, at some point, usually there's a cap where you can't carry over into the next year. And I just didn't see it mentioned in here. That's all. So, the, so you can have a total cap of the amount. So Tanya mentioned 320 hours as 40 days of vacation cap. So that's what you can have. So if you use over that, you lose it. So you can either carry it, you can carry it forward to next year, but you can't get more than that. So if you keep adding more, uh, but that's the amount that the city's on the hook for if you leave and we have to pay out. Right, right. And likewise, there's 960 hours for six time, sick time. So that's also capped. That's that's correct. That's capped, but we also don't pay that out. And that's right. They can't take it with them. Right. Okay. And uh, one other question. I was glad to see giving some money to the parks and recreation, but I was wondering how you calculated $225. <laughs> because that's what the union contract provides for those types of benefits and uh, they okay. similar kind of labor work. And so it was just an inequity that we're, we're providing those kind of, uh, I was thinking one pair of shoes, one pair of pants and one shirt. That's it. <laughs> well, that's, that's essentially what it is, but it's, it was just, you know, they're doing comparable work. They're getting dirty. They're, you know, yeah. you still shoes or whatever. And uh, no, I thought it was very small. I was glad to see they were getting something. So, Thank, thank you for getting it done. Thank you. Um, Connor and then Jack and then Lauren. Yeah, just one thing, it was a little unclear when I was reading it. It's uh, we're not considering all city employees covered under the Hatch Act, right? Only ones whose positions are fully or partially funded by federal dollars, right? Well, so this- I city, hear your question. It's about the Hatch Act. All city employees, because the city re generally receives federal money um, that isn't necessarily applied to specific um, employees. So we've we've applied it. We've basically said all employees should be exempt from sort of political activity. Can, can we do that? If, like federal money isn't going to their salary? I mean, it's, this has all been reviewed. We weren't told we couldn't. I, I, you know, I don't. Well, I mean, I think I think with the Hatch Act, if it's if there's any federal money that comes to the city, you know, they can't necessarily say you non-federally employed person can't do this, but they can sort of set and saying we'll withdraw all our money if any city employee violates the Hatch Act, kind of thing, make it a blanket for the entire city receiving the funds. Is that, is that your understanding, Bill? That's how we've managed it. Yeah. Uh, I, I just know like state government, you know, if positions were completely funded by the general fund, you would have some state employees who were not covered, covered under the Hatch Act. Huh. So, the, so I don't know how the state manages their budget. You know, for us, we have revenues in the, we have general fund revenues that are federal revenues. So there's no, you know, they're offsets to our budget. They're not necessarily for certain specific positions. So um, that's how we've handled this. I'm, I'm flipping through here trying to find that specific um, provision, but that's generally how we've how we've handled it. We, it's never, I mean, we've never really had a problem with it. Okay, you know. and it probably wouldn't come up enough. Uh, Jack and then Lauren. Thank you. I was just going to, answer Donna's question, the uh, maximums, because uh, I I didn't find this at first either, the, the salary or vacation time accrual is on page 12 under subhead A there, and it lays out the maximum which goes up with, uh, with increasing tenure um, up to a max of uh, 40 days. Um, So, so it is there. You're welcome. No. Yeah, I saw the that accrual. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, overall, I, I think it looks great and it's great to have it. I know it's been on the plate for a long time, so um, great to see. Um, one thing I just wanted to note was um, with the creative discourse, the social and economic justice um, you know, process that's going on, one thing that did come up was that often looking at hiring practices, personnel policies and things are something that I would imagine, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they wanted to look at that and you know, see if there's any, you know, the way Connor uh, flagged the, the credit scores can be an equity issue or, or other things. So um, nothing, you know, that's jumping out to me and some of it might be the way things are implemented less than the personnel policy itself. Um, but just, just noting that, you know, if, if that group comes up with anything, you know, obviously we can come back to the council with any um, suggestions or recommendations um, in the future. Um, but I know that that's, you know, often a place that those processes will, will want to look at how we're hiring and treating employees in, in equitable ways. Um, so just noting that, um, was curious, um, with this new kind of remote world we're in, I saw that there's still a mention of remote work for weather, but no other has this, is the city thinking at all about like allowing any employees to do remote work for positions where that would be feasible for some portion of their time, um, or is that not really? Yes, we are. And, um, you know, that probably could be addressed uh, just even in the time since we started started this. Um, you know, we certainly have done it this year, uh, successfully in some cases and less successfully in others. Um, so I, I think the assignment, of, you know, if a person can work remotely, they're still subject to these rules and regulations. I think we were just offering... In that particular case, it was sort of if there's a snow day and you can't come in, you have this option. But it doesn't, in my mind, preclude that option any other time. And I would suspect now that we're all more savvy at using this technology that on snow days and other days, um, people that would have otherwise just said, hey, I can't come in, may find themselves you know, working half a day or whatever. Taking you know, Same thing with like sick kids or something. You know, Before, it was just, I'm out now oh well, you know if they're sleeping i can do a couple hours of work so you know we intend to be as flexible as we can with that i think the other thing to just to your earlier point one of the things we looked at when we went through was certainly looking for anything that might be biased but you know we would welcome any additional view on that we also tried to change all our language to a more restorative language as opposed to real disciplinary language um, but you know these are long-standing practices that have history, so you know we're trying to evolve that. So we would certainly welcome uh, any feedback, uh, whether you know some of them may be actual amendments to the policy, which we can do anytime. I mean, council can anytime because you know, we can recommend them anytime. And the others may just be under, you know, talks about like hiring, for example, just as the manager can set a hiring practice. And I could see, you know, with a couple of our hires this year, we we cast our net wider. Than we had before we, we reached out to you know some minority publications and you know different types of platforms to try to see if we could get different types of applicants so um you know yes we would love that feedback thanks um only other thing just noting and i, I don't think no change i'm proposing tonight but just like family leave you know i wish the state had passed a much more generous um, program than we have. I would love the city to be doing more, um, not, you know, bringing that up tonight. I know that would be a big policy discussion, um, but just, you know, for all of us in our, in our state and country, I wish we had much more generous family leave. And so um, ongoing conversation that we can we, have. We agree. Place. Although interestingly enough, it was actually quite a robust conversation amongst our staff and, um, surprised at how many people, women, um, were not supportive of that. They were like, nope, this is good. This is what, you know, we're fine. Um, I was a little bit surprised by it. So what we have is what the group came up with. <laughs> okay, any other comments or questions? Uh, okay, is there a motion regarding uh, this revision to the personnel policy, and I think there was perhaps a, some conditions there. So, Jack, go ahead. I move that we adopt the personnel policy subject to the uh, 
the discussion and recommendation made uh, earlier about uh, credit checks. I'll second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I just want to thank Tanya. She worked really hard in this, uh, not only in the committee, but sifting through all the things. And you know, she's not someone who gets a lot of airtime here at the council meeting, but she's really one of our internal unsung heroes. So I'm glad um, you get to see the, you know, the advantage of the product of her work. Cameron jumped in a lot. Sue Allen did a lot on this before um, she left. Um, but really, you know, this all fell at the end on Tanya, and, and so thank her for her work. Yeah, this is great. Yes, thank you, Tanya, and and all the the folks who worked on it. Um, all right, any further comments? Uh, Donna. Well, I also want to thank Tanya and apologize that underneath the, the table of content there is a list of all those policies but on my computer i just screened right by it but you list all of them so thank you that's very helpful to know and i wanted no to need to apologize her. at all <laughs> i wanted to send tanya a chat but it's disallowed so is there a reason cameron why we can't have a chat key um, i keep chat features off because it uh if we had a huge group it'd be hard to monitor but also okay. All of those are public record, and I'm um, yeah. not to say that it's not fine to have a public record. It's just an additional public record. So. Okay, that's it. That's all right. I just had to interrupt a banker. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, well, thanks again uh, for all your work on this. And it's been, uh, you know, a long process to get here. And I'm so grateful. Um, Thank so, you yeah. for supporting us. Yeah. All right. So um, it's, I think we're up to the winter parking option discussion. Um, by the way, I'm sort of aiming to take a break at uh, 830 or so, but we are making good time so far, which is great. Um, so for this, am I turning it over to, it looks like um, perhaps Zach and Donna are on the same line there, or is it? My, or am I turning it over to, to Bill? Either way. <laughs> uh, you can turn it over to me, but it's gonna go straight to Zach, and I don't know if I, is Don, yeah, Donna's there too, and it looks like probably Tom's in on this too, so. Awesome. Uh, so DPW, I will say just to introduce that you may recall last winter we had some discussions about amending the um, about amending the uh, policy, and of course we had a lot of pushback. So DPW spent a fair amount of time looking at options, and they're so they're proposing something that we have not done before. So like you know, hear them out and. Give them their feedback because we, you know, we, if we're going to make a change, we need to publicize it. And you saw that they had a communication change. So, anyway, with that, I'm going to turn it over to them. Thanks. Um, so Zach and I, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, Zach and I will um, go through this with you tonight. Um, we're here to discuss, obviously, how we handle winter operations. Um, in any given year, we'd be sitting here talking to you about winter operations. This year, it's a little bit different. Um, and uh, we are feeling that given a variety of set of circumstances that we need to um, propose a really different approach to how we're going to handle um, the winter operations. Um, and why is it different? It's different because of COVID. It's different because the department's staffing is down by six positions. Um, it's different because of the city's budgetary concerns um, moving forward um, and the amount of overtime that has typically been accrued uh, by our staff, which we feel is necessary under the previous um, procedures for clearing snow, um, but which puts us in a position, especially with um, a smaller um, 
roster of individuals to do that work this year in a situation that could be, um, well, it, it could be a, a situation in which um, people are working way too many hours and it's our responsibility to avoid that kind of situation. Um, so winter months, it's an all hands on deck situation. Um, there's never a snow event in which um, we can mobilize our team and have people who are at home resting. Um, and so I think that becomes um, a directive to us to not only maintain safe roads, but to maintain safety for the people who are clearing those areas. Um, so as a result, we've come to the conclusion that we really need to modify the status quo that's existed. Um, and we looked at a variety of different ways to go about that. Um, and we're going to present a different option, as Bill had said, for snow removal. It's identified in your packet as option B, alternating side parking ban. Um, some of you um, having taken a look at this may recognize this or may feel as if you've um, seen this or had um, exposure to it because it's successfully, it's a process that's successfully used in Burlington. And while around the Northeast, there aren't um, a, a sizable number of communities who's, who uses it, um, there are communi other communities who use it. We think it's a pretty easy system for people to understand um, and to comply with once they get accustomed to it. And that is different from what's happened in the past. So in its simplest form, residents simply park on um, the side of the street with even numbers on one day and odd numbers on another day. And there becomes a schedule of maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it's even numbers, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, it's odd numbers, whatever it is, we set that up. And that stays in effect for the entire winter. So while there may be initially some confusion about which day is which, we'll have um, deployed adequate signage and we'll be reinforcing that pattern of behavior for the entire season. I think it's easy to remember, um, cars will be required to move or park during a standardized time. Um, this will allow us not only to clear snow from um, the, the space that cars are driving in, but it allows us to get close to the, to the accumulated snow banks, which often cause us to it, um, re be required to cl um, close streets for a particular night so that we can call in additional equipment and we can clear those snow banks. Um, we will be regularly in a position where we can keep that additional work to a minimum, um, no matter what level of snowfall we experience. I think that will be appreciated um, not only um, by our department, but it's a much better safety standard for residents because when the snow starts to fall into the street and snow banks get high. There are pedestrian issues as well as parking issues for all of our residents and visitors. Um, I think that the practice of shifting streets, I, I know that we've decided that the practice of shifting um, parking from one side of the street to the other um, will just create um, a very easy to understand system that is effective, not only for us, it diminishes um, potentially over time accumulation um, and results in clearer streets in general. Um, I think that the downsides of this that we have to address and we brainstormed and we'll seek additional input on are how do we message this kind of change um, what level of communication do we need? Um, do we have a period of time where we're adjusting to that and we're going to um, accommodate some unusual situations? Um, there are some 
concerns um, by police that the timing that we'll need to have for this is slightly off what they would prefer, but we did meet with them. We talked it through. They're willing to cooperate with us um, if the council is willing to move forward with this kind of recommendation. So Zach has been our guru on this um, and he's investigated it. He's worked um, it through. We've worked collectively with um, Deputy Director Kurt Modica um, on this as well. And so I'm going to turn this over to him to um, give much more specific details and then we'll open it up for questions. All right. Um, so first of all, as Donna mentioned, um, this year uh, we're in very different times than we've been in in previous years. Um, staffing is a very big concern. So we really had to think, rethink about how we are going to approach this winter. Um, it has been a problem uh, dealing with the winter ban and actually being able to clear uh, the streets. Um, so we have tried to uh, really wrap our head around uh, a proposal that we feel that would work for our, our operational needs. Um, so to begin, um, I'm just going to go over some highlight points uh, of what we are proposing. Um, and then I have a map prepared that we can take a look at. And if there are specific areas, uh, we can have a little bit of a conversation and look at um, some of the individual or site specific concerns that uh, we may have. Um, so first of all, by incorporating an alternate side winter parking ban, um, we take all of the cars and we put them on one side of the street. And what that does is that it allows us to be able to get to clean the, the other half of the street well. Um, in past practice, when there's a car that is blocking the street on either side of the road, it takes about 60 to 70 feet to taper outside of around the car, get past the car and to get back to the curb line. So for every car that we come across in a winter event, you have six, 60 to 70 feet of roadway that you cannot get to. And what that does is it requires us to alter our, um, our routes. We have to go back to areas um, and see if the cars have moved. Um, and a lot of the times they have not yet. So we're going back to the same streets multiple times just to check to see if we can now address that area. Um, and it really turns into, it really snowballs and residents call and say, why haven't you gotten here yet? And there we have, we're responding to, we're reacting to citizen complaints and not being proactive in our approach about how we deal with winter operations. Um, so a few points, um, we would ask cars to switch sides between the hours of 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. on any given day. The downtown area where there is currently parking meters and parking on both sides, would people would be allowed to park during the daytime on both sides of the street. Um, so it's kind of an ex exemption to what we're talking about, but we recognize that you know the downtown businesses uh, everywhere where there's a parking meter, uh, we need to be able to allow people to park. Um, so that would still be allowed at 10 p.m. if you were parked if between 5 and 10 p.m. if you were on State Street you would be asked to move to the other side of the road. Um, the right now for the purposes of this conversation, we've outlined the parking area as um, the downtown. It's really the exemption area, um, which is only where there's parking meters. There are a couple instances where we may want to expand the zone a little bit. Um, and we'll get into that when we talk about when we actually take a look at the map. Um, I just want to point out that there are many streets, uh, as it happened last year, where we had to go out and put no parking signs and people weren't able to park on either side of the street, which was, is when no one can park on the street, it's even worse of a scenario. Uh, we can't, we one, can't maintain the street, two people can't park there, and three, they have to be, it has to be posted for um, no parking just so that emergency vehicles can pass through. Um, there was a time last year when we had the majority of Berry Street, Liberty Street, Hubbard, and Loomis all had no parking signs out. And it was to the point last year that we had to go make 
uh, 200 signs just so that we could keep putting signs out because all of ours, all of our current no parking signs were already deployed. Um, so it's those type of issues that we have that takes a lot of time for us to adjust and um, in order to deal with the winter operations. So with that being said, um, I want to I want to share my screen and show you guys the map and then we can start looking at specific areas and um, looking at some of the data. Um, I do want to note that we have um, we went out and did parking counts over the last couple of days to gauge how many people are utilizing on street parking uh, on any given time and on any given day um, prior to the winter season coming. Cameron, can you allow me to share my screen? I'm working on it, sorry. Okay. You should be able to now. You should be good. Just use the green square. There you go. Yep. This is taking a second. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. So we, I do want to acknowledge that there are a lot of area, areas uh, and streets that um, have ordinances that, are, that need to be revised, that there are a lot of kind of conflicting language within our ordinance. Um, we have started to go through each individual line street by street um, and trying to develop consistency within the ordinance. Um, I find that the ordinance as it reads right now would be is very hard for the general public to follow. Um, if you lived on any street, it's their streets listed two, three, four times in the ordinance. Um, so what we did is we the blue indicates um, it is odd side parking. So on an odd calendar day, you park on the odd side of the street and the green ind indicates uh, even calendar day, even side of the street. So today is the 9th. If this was in December, we would be parking on the odd side of the street, which is indicated in blue. Um, what we went and did is we looked at the parking need. So when we evaluated over a period of three separate uh, counts, uh, we logged 42 cars along Berry Street. Now, when we take a look at available parking, whether it's one side or the other, if you take, um, if you add up all of the blue section, you have more than 42 spaces. If you add up all the green section, you have more than 42 as well. Um, so we've gone through and looked at the majority of streets and tried to find where this wouldn't work. And we're really not finding a lot of areas that um, this type of approach would not work for us. Um, I do want to say that there are other streets that wouldn't, by allowing alternate parking, we'd probably free up additional spaces that wouldn't typically be used at points in time. Um, there are streets on our uh, no overnight list um, that people cannot use um, or shouldn't be using per, per ordinance. and. Um, we feel that by alternating, we can where you can actually provide more available spaces um, on any given day. Um, so, with that being said, I will show you these this brown or light brown color here that you see is the outline of the parking meter zone. So everywhere where where the city has parking meters, um, that zone, which well, I guess it's the easiest thing to call it is a a parking meter zone is outlined in the brown. Um, so those would allow, um, if there were on State Street, if you had uh, two-sided parking, people would be allowed to park any um, throughout the day up until 10 p.m. on either side of the road. If I can interrupt there, so at, at 10 p.m., then they would be required to move to the correct um, corresponding calendar day side of the street. Is that correct? Yes. And then, so the, the, the question that we've always had to deal with is when parking overnight, how do you, how do you craft that? 
Um, and the way that we have wrapped our head around it right now is that uh, you park on the same side as the same calendar day, unless you plan to be parking overnight, and then you need to park on the opposite side of the street. And um, there's not really a great way to message that, um, but it's it's something that we feel is with you know with enough messaging that it, it really shouldn't be too big of an issue. It's similar to um, our parking lots, um, except for I find that it's probably a little bit cleaner. Um, at least for me to understand. Are there other types of questions? Are there things that we, that people would like to discuss? One area that um, I had anticipated uh, we would need to talk about is school and Loomis, um, especially with the high use of um, people that utilize um, School Street and then the portion of Loomis for uh, drop off to UES. Um, we would be we would be open to extending this brown metered zone down School Street and on Loomis to up to Liberty, um, which would not impact uh, the newly approved plans that uh, allowed for additional parking on Loomis for a few residents um, with the school changes that we have. Is City Council on her? No. <laughs> um, if if I can, can you can you just um, tell us uh, a, a, a little bit more about that? Um, why might we be considering? extending the uh, brown zone uh, down Loomis, et cetera? Uh, so this is one of the few areas that um, with teachers and the amount of people that are coming to UES on a daily basis, uh, we figured that there, there may be uh, an additional need. Um, so we would be open to extending that area uh, on School Street and down to Loomis. Um, it has a really high volume of daytime parkers um, so by, if you were to only allow one side of the street there, uh, we may be pushing a lot of people into the uh, outlying streets, uh, Harrison Avenue, St. Paul, and other areas. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. So, you know, I, um, so be, because for the rest of the, like the non-brown area, the parking is banned for one side of the street all day. Is that, that's correct, right? Yes, so like Liberty Street, any given day, you would be parking on either the even side or the odd side. Right. Um, yeah, that's, that would probably be a, a change for people to process because they're used to parking anywhere they want during the day. Um, and that a ban applies at night because that's when snow gets cleaned up, but that wouldn't necessarily be the case um, with this plan. Yeah, we're, we're trying to allow for um, more clearing of streets during our operational window that we're here. Because um, right. right now, the way that it is, we have between the hours of 1 a.m. and 7 a.m. if we call a ban. Um, right. Or we just kind of deal with it as is and go around cars and kind of make the best of a scenario that's not really that, that great. Um, if anyone has traveled down Liberty Street on any given day, regardless of snow, you can't really pass two-way traffic. I mean, if there's cars on both sides of the street, you're stopping, you're pulling over, and you're allowing a car to go. Yeah. Um, so there's already a need there, regardless of winter. Um, but this is something that, you know, I think for emergency access, for um, a lot of the, the complaints that we deal with, uh, this could be, this could greatly help us. Um, I, it makes sense to me that it would be uh, that we would extend it around um, Loomis or so for the sake of the elementary school there. Um, that makes sense to me. I'll, but uh, I'll, I, I see other people have things they want to say. So uh, Dan and then Lauren, did you have a hand raise? And then Jay? Okay, yeah, go ahead. So a couple of questions. Um, if I'm understanding correctly. So on, on sections of street where like, for example, St. Paul, 
that you have up where there's only parking on the um, the blue side, would would the would the parking be allowed on the opposite side on those on those days, or would it just simply be no one could park on St. Paul Street on on green days? So that's what we're doing right now, going through the ordinance. Is we're most a lot of streets we feel that we could swap the parking on one side. Most streets right now are set up that the parking is on the sidewalk side. So um, in, in most areas, it's right adjacent. The parking is right next to the sidewalk. Um, there are a lot of streets like St. Paul that I don't, we don't see any site obstructions, any real issue for swapping the side of the street for, to allow parking. So in this instance, we would probably allow, um, there would be, right now it's not written per the ordinance that you can, that parking is allowed on the other side of the street. Um, but as part of this revision, we would look at um, adding in green spaces um, along that street. Okay, so so where it was where it was possible, and I guess I would con contrast St. Paul Street with say Cedar Street, where one side of Cedar Street is non sidewalk and sort of just hill <coughs> hillside. You wouldn't want to allow people to park on. You wouldn't create a blue parking where there's no sidewalk on the other side of the street. I mean, we looked at, we specifically looked at Cedar Street and looked at whether it was feasible or not to put cars on the other side. And it's just, it's not really um, on that street. I mean, it's it's very narrow. We put all of our snow on the hillside anyway. Right. Um, so you'd be asking people to open a car door with a passenger into a snow bank. Um, we didn't feel that that was a really a, a good, an area that that system would work in. Uh, but everywhere that we can, we're, tr we're looking at, um, you know, providing additional opportunities for the alternate side. Okay. And um, I guess that would, you know, and I, I don't want necessarily a street by street, but so that that's a general plan is to any street where it's possible to add, even if it doesn't have parking now under this plan, you would, you would adopt parking or we would adopt parking. Uh, on opposite sides, so that cars would just simply switch back and forth, given the day. Um, yes, that that is correct. Okay, uh, so how much uh, signage do you think this is going to require to sort of notify? Because it's, it strikes me that beyond the question of um, of educating and sort of getting this out through public notice, you know, there's going to be a lot of necessary signage to denote that you can't park on this side of the street on these these type of days or you know to denote that they're the, the parking switches yeah so i mean the one the one good thing is that um in a lot of areas by adding or clarifying with one sign or two signs um you'd be able to to make the switch um but yes, it, it would require us to evaluate how many signs. Um, we do have the capability to do, to do that all in house and we would utilize um, all the existing posts that we could so we wouldn't have to do new installs. Um, but that is when we're going through each street one by one, we're looking at um, how does the ordinance read and what would have to happen to signage. Um, okay. Um, and then, um, would this be, would this follow the same sort of seasonal, uh, pattern as the old or the existing, uh, pattern from like November 15th through, or November 1st through the, through the end of April or, or Mar I'm sorry, March 15th or so, or would this, would you be looking at a different timeline for this? Um, so right now we're only discussing in the same timeline. So November 15th. To April 1st. Um, it could be considered for street sweeping, but I don't really want to really go too far down that rabbit hole at, at this time. Um, I mean, the need is around winter operations. Uh, so that's what we'd be geared, uh, geared towards. Um, if it was a success and we wanted to revisit it at other points of the year, we could. Uh, but uh, for this winter, that's all we would be looking at and proposing is November 15th, April 1st. Right. And, and I guess my last question, I, I appreciate the opportunity to ask several of them, uh, is, is this a situation where, 
in other cities that have adopted this type of cross street parking, um, you, you know, what kind of enforcement have they had to use and what kind of enforcement do we expect to get people sort of educated with that kind of program? And because it seems um, to me be somewhat more complicated and involved. Yeah, so it, it seems complicated. Um, a lot of other communities have done like little flyers uh, that, you know, that we could reuse um, that are, you know, pretty straightforward and simplistic. Um, I think uh, in terms of getting the communications out, um, we would, you know, I, we had talked about, uh, say, November, we'd have a, a, a time period where we began implementation, but we would just be giving uh, like windshield notices, you know, on say starting on December 1st, uh, the alternate side parking goes in, a f in fully into effect and tickets will be issued. Um, other areas uh, have done, they will ticket you if you are uh, not parked in the right location. And if there is a need, like a department need, uh, then it's either a, a, a higher value ticket number or it's towed. Um, so that would be something that we would have to, to work out. Um, but generally I would say that we would be asking PD to go around and to ticket anyone not on the correct side of the road. Um, and I, you know, I think that if people are lined up correctly, then we should in the most circumstances, I don't even know if we would have to tow on, unless it was, there was a, a really big need for it. Um, Okay, thanks. Um, Lauren and then Jay. Um, thanks, just a couple of quick things. Um, one, just wanted to um, agree with the idea of extending um, for, for School Street. I mean, they're asking parents, you know, as much as possible to drive their kids this year and not take the bus to minimize busing, as you know. So having been there the last couple of days dropping my kids off, it is, a cluster. So I would, I think it's going to be a, a bit of a, you know, very busy, you know, so trying to make that as um, accessible a street as possible makes sense to me um, for parking. Um, I mean, I think overall it like, I, you know, it sounds like with the, it's good creative thinking and it seems worth trying. I think we've all gotten you know, we're all trying a lot of new things this year we've never done before. So if we're going to ask people to try something new any year, you know, hopefully everyone's got the can do spirit and <laughs> can, um, you know, add this in. And I know this came up last year and it was kind of a, an education uh, and issue was raised. But, um, you know, I think that piece of it seems like the critical um, component is how we're getting the word out and the signage and the flyers that explain it in a way that people get and lots of lead time and all of that, which it sounds like you're doing a lot of good thinking around. Um, sounds like that issue of the like overnight parking, really figuring out how to, how to message that will be a tricky one, but um, I'm sure you guys can do it. So that's my first impression. Thanks. Uh, Jay. Thanks. So thanks Zach and, and Donna, just a couple of thoughts on this. Um, one is I think when it, when it comes to this type of thing, um, having gone through the Park Avenue closure a few years ago, I realized that the two most important things with traffic patterns are consistency and predictability. And so I do really like the idea of um, of moving to this type of system because there's <laughs> if there's one thing that's not predictable, it's the weather in Vermont um, in the wintertime. So, um, and I don't love the, you know, the flashing signs as everybody's coming into town and all of that, like trying to do it based on weather forecasts is really challenging. So I do um, really like this approach. Um, just a couple small things. Um, I do think from a communication standpoint, um, probably, you know, and, and I looked at the communications plan that Don had put together that said that, um, uh, that you'd start putting uh, flyers on cars starting November 15th, and then it would go into effect on December 15th. And I think that that's a good idea. I would also recommend that the signs go up on November 15th 
letting people know that, hey, this is how it's going to be um, through this winter. And so like seeing those signs and, and people like sort of trying to understand what's coming, um, I think is going to be really important. And I think between the signage and the notifications on cars, then we can we can help that education period. You know, it's got to be more than just a week or two, because um, you know who knows when the first snow is going to happen. Um, and so I do think that 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 part is really important. I think it's going to be tricky um, on roads where you know St. Paul is is an example where there's like only parking on one side, but on Liberty Street there's parts where there's parking on one side but not another. And so, like, it just, I think there's just, we want to make sure that we're communicating to, to folks to, that they understand um, what to expect and what's going to happen, um, you know, what the changes are going to be. And I, I guess two, two small things um, is, is one, I'm hoping that you did the parking counts in the last 48 hours. Yeah. Um, we did. Be perfect. Great. Um, because obviously things change a lot around, uh, in the downtown area with all the schooling. And then, you know, obviously the, you know, you've got a number of parking spaces noted on Park Avenue that you can't account for, um, for, for this school year. So um, I think that's it. I do, I do really appreciate this approach. I think it's, it's going to, there's going to have to be a, there's going to be a learning process, but I think the, the as far as we can get ahead of it as, as as much as possible, the more successful it'll be. So thanks a lot for your work on this. Thank you. Um, I will say that Don and I talked briefly um, today about uh, trying to speed up the process as much as we can so that there, I mean, if say November 1st, if we already had the signs out, um, and they had all the month of November in, in the chance that it snows, we're not, you know, stuck. Um, so as much as we can and going through the public hearings and the other stuff, um, if we can kind of speed it up, I think that that would be beneficial for the community so that we have a little bit of a, um, we're not, you know, really coming up to the last day of, um, you know, it taking effect. So in the event that we have a big snowstorm on November 1st, you know, what do we do uh, type scenario. Um, so that's something that we were kind of just floating back, uh, you know, back and forth between, um, you know, prior to the meeting um, is, you know, how aggressive can this timeline and approach be so that, because the longer the better, honestly, like in terms of getting, you know, the word out. Um, so if we end up going to this direct in this direction, then um, the more exposure that the public can have to it, I, I think the better. Um, we also have, I've been looking at uh, ways to implement um, text notifications. Other communities have um, like a sign up bulletin where they, anyone that registers gets pinged a text, phone call, email, or whatever method that they want um, with the notification saying, hey, today is an even calendar day, park on the even side of the street. Um, there is a, a few different vendors and, uh, we're just looking into, um, the feasibility of what that, that might look like. Um, some of them come at costs, um, typically nothing's free anymore. Um, so, um, we may be coming back with a, a proposal of some sorts for the communications as well. Uh, I think I saw uh, Jack, then Donna, then Connor. <laughs> Thanks. Um, a couple of questions. One, as someone who grew up listening to the uh, radio every morning, uh, announcing what days in New York City, the alternate side of the street parking rules would be in effect or would be suspended. It just makes me wonder, are you anticipating any dates like holidays or anything where uh, the rules would be suspended because it, they aren't days when uh, our workers would normally be working? Or do you think you'll go with the simplicity of just having it be every day? So um, I think the easy answer is simplicity of every day, um, consistency. Um, I, I think last year was the first time that our streets supervisor 
got to spend Christmas Day with his family in like six years. Uh, so um, I think the reality is that most days uh, our crews are asked to do something. It may not be intuitive to the general public about what they're asked to do, uh, but the majority of every day between November 15th and April 1st, they're either salting, sanding, plowing, pushing back snow banks or removing snow. Thanks. Another question that occurred to me is that as you went around the city, have you identified any uh, streets or sections of streets where you think it's not really feasible to, uh, to do the alternating? Like our, last year, we spent a lot of time talking about parking on, on Sibley Avenue, for example, and just for many years of driving up and down that street, it seems like it might be tricky to have the uh, have the parking on the other side, um, and there may be other streets like that where it might not be workable. Yeah, so um, Jack, we did look at that, and um, as you'll see, we did not feel that the lower section of Sibley, um, directly across from where they have available parking now, would be feasible between College and Berry Street. Um, we did take a look at the upper section of Sibley, and we felt that there was ample room and space and uh, sight lines that it could be on the other side as well. Um, but not on that lower section um, between College and Berry Street. Mm -hmm. um, so that is some of what we've been doing over the past couple of days is evaluating, um, you know, exactly what is available. The other thing that I will say is we have a lot of streets that are in these pink streets here where we don't have any regulation currently. So there's no ordinance that would prohibit it. Um, however, if people started to park on both sides of the street, uh, we may find that we are in another instance where um, it's not that they have to go to the alternating. Um, so there's a lot of other streets that are not specifically mentioned in the ordinance one way or another um, that we also feel that would should be on the same uh, format, um, such as, you know, these ones in pink that we're looking at currently. Thanks. Um, who was next? Was it Connor or Donna? I think it was Donna. Doesn't matter. We'll talk sometime. <laughs> <laughs> but to follow up on the pink streets, I would prefer that you treat all the streets as much as possible the same and every day the same and no exception short of a flood, you know? Uh, but I, like Jack mentioned in New York, I mean, I visited friends and they just knew you alternated days all the time, summertime, wintertime, you just did it. Street sweeping was as important as snow plowing. So I like that. I like the idea of doing it and it's clear and it's group mentality. People will see other people moving. And so I think they'll get the idea even quicker than, than lots of signs is that once we get it installed, people will really help one another and remind one another. So I really like it, and I really appreciate the timeline. I would move it up if you could so that you get more time before snow hits. I think, you know, we can have November storms, but I think it's a great idea, and I fully support it and appreciate all the information you and Donna shared. Thank you. Go ahead, Connor. All right. Well, thanks very much, everybody, for doing that. I think it'll be... Uh... Definitely some growing pains, but it's uh, I think it's the best option on the table. Uh, just as far as uh, communications, I would consider doing a robocall, which everybody hates, but it's a really cheap way to get the message out. Uh, I was just looking at pricing on the phone there. I think you could do it for about like 300 bucks and get everybody in town a robocall uh, with the option of them opting out afterwards to the degree we have telephone numbers. So again, I would do that rarely, but I think this is a case where you could probably do it. Can I ask Connor a question? Sure, go ahead. Connor, I mean, they have Vermont Alert and you can get texts. Like right now, you get texts on the street of having the streets ban. And could they not just text everybody? They, they could text it too. I mean, like like that's uh, that's opt-in. I would give them the option of opting out. It's uh, 
But you think phone numbers are easier to obtain. I got gotcha. you. One of the issues with Vermont Alert, if I can just jump in, um, we're not sure that this will qualify. Vermont Alert requires there to be some sort of emergency or some sort of event that's so a, a winter parking ban in a snowstorm or for snow removal is considered an okay use for Vermont Alert. Okay. We haven't got, we're not sure whether we could use Vermont Alert. You know, maybe we could they give us permission to use it once for a sort of, this is the way we're gonna change things. But they certainly aren't gonna allow us to do it daily and say, you know, park on the odd side, park okay. on the even yeah. side. Yeah, that's good to know. Thank you. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. Um, so I guess the, the one of the questions, has has this map been circulated to the public at all or any opportunity for public feedback on it? Not yet. Um, we were really looking for kind of an authorization to proceed uh, that we wanted council to kind of give us their blessing to, to go down this road. Uh, then we will finalize the map and then we need to start uh, having some public uh, meetings and allow people to come ask questions, to voice their concerns, uh, to go um, really through the public hearing process. Okay. And th at that point, it would be an opportunity for people to sort of look to say, you can't have a car park here because it's, everybody knows nobody can park here for Absolutely. some particular reason. Um because I think I mean, it, that strikes me as one important part. And I, I'd echo Donna's uh, comment that we have to be as uniform as possible in how these streets are, you know, in these patterns, because if there are certain streets that are every other street, but other streets that are not every other street or, you know, any kind of uh, variation makes it more complicated for people to learn. And, I, and I, I've also experienced the city tradition of parking on either side of the street as well. But, you know, that's a new concept uh, for a lot of people that they're going to have to learn. And the more simple that we can, you know, if we're going down this road, the more simple we can do it, the better. And, and this is one of those problems that, you know, it, it's hard. It's hard to remove snow and plow city streets. You know, there's no simple solution as long as there are cars on the streets. Um, so, the more consistent, uniform, easy, non-thinking we can make it, that people can simply memorize a pattern, I, I think is gonna be better. Um, and I do like that this option over the uh, the current option in that it is it is just predictability. It's a, it's a pattern that repeats itself as opposed to checking alerts or lights or signals or weather forecasts or crystal walls or tea leaves. So I, I support this as well, but obviously consistency and, and public feedback are gonna be two of the keys beyond the communication portions that you guys have, have started to outline. So I wanna jump in here as well uh, and think about the process from this point. So I, I'm, before I say that, I'm also, uh, very interested in this. I think this is going to be a, a great improvement for, particularly for staff, <laughs> over uh, the current situation, and and for honestly uh, people as well. As, as long as there is not a significant um, reduction in available parking in the in the winter, and and just the predictability. Anyway, uh, so all that is to say that if we move forward with approving this. Um, approving you all to move forward with uh, pursuing this uh, path uh, tonight, then that means that you all would be coming back to us uh, with a formal finalized proposal. Is that correct? Or would you need, or would you perceive that you would need to come back to us? I think you probably would, but I'm, yeah. What do you think about that? So my thought is that because it's a significant change to ordinance, you would have to have a first and second reading, which is right. why the timeline is so, it's so important for this conversation. Yeah. So I, my feeling is that once we had the first reading, had feedback, had the second reading, we would then be able to come back to city council for final approval and adoption of the, yeah. the plan. 
So uh, I just want to also flag that this might be an area where we could potentially reach reach out to particular neighborhoods through the capital area neighborhoods uh, group. Uh, if there are particular mm -hmm. streets that seem problematic, that they are uh, a mechanism to target some messaging, uh, particularly to get feedback. Um, beyond that, any further comments or questions on this, uh, either from council or the public? Okay. Um, is I think there uh, we could probably use a motion as to whether or not to move forward. Uh, Donna, go ahead. But yes, I would make a motion to accept the presentation from PDW to go ahead and change the winter parking ban to move forward with the change of the winter parking ban to their alternative winter side alternating streets and come back to us for our first hearing at our next council meeting. Okay. Is that timeline doable? Oh, there's a, a second. Is that timeline doable, Zach and Donna? I think the timeline is doable. The question is whether or not we want to consume a council meeting, the time of the council meeting to have a public hearing. Uh, my thought was that we would have them at a separate date. Um, so, you know, I would. It's, it's pretty much up to you. I mean, and we'll we'll go on whatever direction you guys tell us, uh, but. We won't let you talk so much the next time. We'll hear from the public and. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's easier to do it at council meetings than to ask the public to come out to a separate one. It's just harder to, I think, get, hear the notices and see the notices. I think that would be my recommendation for me to come to the next council meeting. An interesting question. Um, Zach, you were thinking of having this as a, a separate meeting because of the volume of comments you thought we might receive or... Yeah, um, I didn't want to completely bog down a whole council meeting um, if there are, I mean, some of the Sibley and Prospect uh, conversations last year kind of consumed the majority of some of the meetings. Um, so I don't know what level of turnout we're going to have. Um, so that was why I initially had, uh, was thinking, you know, that we would kind of do it at, at a separate meeting. Um, but I am, you know, I'm more than willing to, obviously do it at a council meeting as well. Um, that's kind of up to you all. And if we did it at a separate meeting, we could potentially accelerate the timeline. No, he actually makes it slower in his timeline by having his, he doesn't have on the list, they have their second public hitting mid-October versus having it September 23rd. So yes. may, I, may I jump in here too? Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Bill. Just, uh, you know, I, one of the reasons we wanted to have this conversation was before we spent a lot of time like rewriting ordinances and spending a lot of effort. Uh, we didn't want to do that. If you guys were like, this is a crazy idea, you know, forget it. So, you know, we get the sense it's endorsed. I don't know where we are in, you know, drafting ordinances, how much of an ordinance draft change is going to take. So, you know, if we, even for the 23rd, we're talking about, we need to have this done by next Thursday or Friday for it to be, you know, we have, we have a week basically to get all the ordinance changes done. So I'd be a little careful about saying we'll have ordinances ready for the 23rd. You know, it may well be that if we're going to do a public presentation, have questions and answers, explain the thing, we could maybe do that as a public forum in itself and still have the, the actual ordinance changes on public, on council meetings. But well, have some other presentation. Go ahead, Zach, I just do Zach and Donna. Do you feel like you could have this ready by the 23rd? That would best fit your timeline proposal to have the first reading on the 23rd and the second on the 14th. So we can start getting messaging before it starts to snow. I mean, we've already started going through the ordinance as is. Um, I don't want to overcommit by any means, uh, but I think that we would be we would have a, we, I think that it's probably doable. Um, I do want to make sure that we have plenty of time in case something pops up and that we have an issue that there's, you know, a backup date um, of some sort. So um, we can, I, I think, I think we could probably do that. Um, we're also looking at consistency. So 
we're looking at the ordinances, I would like to eliminate, you know, areas where the same portion of the street is mentioned four times under different categories. Um, I think that cleaning this up and making it, you know, alphabetical by street and specifically telling people what they are and are not allowed to do um, would be very helpful because it's been a little bit tedious trying to read exactly every section and make sure that there's not anything contradicting different sections. Uh, go ahead, Donna. Would the, would the timing be more comfortable if you didn't expect perfection for the first public hearing and that you do a rough cut and then if indeed there's more editing for the second hearing, I think that's allowable? That would be great. That would, that yes, that would feel much yes. better on yeah. the staff side of it. Um, just because this is new that I, I feel yeah. that we are going to continuously have some uh, alterations as we're working this through. And there are three weeks between the 23rd and the 14th. Oh, right. So it's a, it's a while. So this uh, is an extra time to get. So yeah. you do our best shot on the first hearing, and then you really come and polish it for the second. First community feedback. But, yeah. uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'd even take a, a step further. It, it strikes me that the really key issue here is getting uh, some of the public feedback, particularly on the streets, because then that's going to inform how you write the ordinances such that I, I would feel comfortable, um, you know, if this did start the first notice being, you know, in the in beginning of October and, you know, the final, uh, the final hearing either being at the end of October or the beginning of November, as so long as there was a public engagement process. And, you know, what we're passing tonight is basically a direction to you to go forward down this road um, and that if the ordinance was, the ordinance is kind of the, the, the final piece and, and really what, what needs to happen is to make sure that this, this plan is worked out to some degree. Um, and that, that strikes me as where the effort really should lie. And if it's, if it's a matter of putting the ordinance into effect a little bit later, not exactly on November 1st, ready to go, but you've done that sort of public outreach, then I think you've, you know that that will in, um, go a longer way than rushing the ordinance and then doing the public outreach. So, how, rather than that's a great point, Dan. Thank you. Um, and maybe rather than us wrestling with this right now, if if we get the sense that um, you're willing to do that, you know that you've got to go ahead and then we can work out with our staff, you know, offline what the best schedule is for us to get this done and also have a public engagement process. And then if it means that the next meeting is the first reading, it will be on the agenda. If it doesn't, we'll let you know. Um, so, or DPW? Uh, Madam Mayor, can uh, I comment on this briefly? Um, yes, go ahead, Stephen. And then Jack and then uh, Donna. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this, uh, to some degree, is going to hinge on whether or not you go back to real meetings that are broadcast in real time over ORCA, because this medium where you're listening and you can't participate with a the phone, there's not enough bandwidth, you can't show maps around town and discuss them uh, adequately in this uh, virtual meeting environment. So to some degree, I also suggest you think about uh, fixed presentations, posters, informative posters that are set up and left up for a few weeks around town and allow people to email comments to the city because this is affecting everybody who commutes to town and parks, people who live here. This is going to be massive uh, disruption. So think about uh, how to, don't think about this virtual meeting context as being adequate as public engagement. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. And I, I think um, it's worth thinking about particularly like if we, we have posters, where might we want to put them? Um, Cause, yeah. Capital ground, yeah. Um, I want to point out that Donna brought up a, a really good point uh, earlier today that um, utilizing uh, the schools, if they are willing to send their kids home with flyers, may be a really, really good idea to yeah. get a lot of residents of Montpelier um, up to speed with what we're asking for. Um, so uh, I think that that is something that we could also utilize um, if they were willing. Yeah, fair. Yeah. Um, no. We're going to be looking at any and all options. I think those are good points that Stephen made. 
and thinking about how we get stuff up, articles in the paper, you know, Facebook, social media, everything we can think of. Um, I know there were a couple other comments. Um, Jack, did you have a comment? Yes, I did. Thank you. I'm just trying to think back to what the language of the motion is, and I think it, and I think it said to come back to have this on our agenda for our next meeting. And I wonder if it might be a good idea to take that part of it out and leave uh, staff the uh, the flexibility of doing it, as Bill said, when they're prepared to. Um, yeah, I was, was going to ask John Odom what he wrote down. I would really like it to be on the agenda, whether it's the first hearing or not. Uh, but. I would certainly take it off the motion. It seems like we could, and um, I forget who seconded it. Was it Connor? Okay, and so Connor's okay with that. Um, so uh, regard, maybe regardless of uh, it being a part of the motion, if we can just have a quick update on it next meeting. I, that, that sounds reasonable to me. Does that sound okay to, to staff? Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. great. So without the, the uh... Uh, the reporting back thing, it should be uh, to accept the presentation from DPW to move forward with the change of the winter parking ban with their alternative proposal. That, uh, I believe that cuts off the, the rest. Uh, side winter parking proposal. Oh, yeah. The alternate side. Alternating alternative side. side. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Whoops. Alternating side winter parking. And and Connery, that's what you understood it to be. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Um, any uh, further discussion on this? Okay. Uh, all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for your work on this. And I'm really hopeful about it. I think this is going to be a really good thing for Montpelier. So very grateful. Um, I just want to recognize 846. Um, I'm hopeful that we can take a, a quick break here, probably on the scale of um, uh, five minutes. Let's aim for that. And um, uh, Stephen, I know you're on the, the line here. Um, I just want to let anybody know that this call is not going to go away. We will be back uh, in about five and we'll, we'll pick up with the next item. All right. We'll see you. We'll see you soon. Are we, are we here? There we go. Okay. They all spend their time. Excellent. Okay. So we are all here. That is great. All right. So the next item is a discussion uh, about public restrooms. Um, so for this, I mean, this was an item that um, Dan Richardson had brought up. And uh, so for this, I feel like I should, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dan, to, uh, to introduce. Okay, um, so I, I think the purpose of this discussion is to have um, a sort of uh, opportunity for us to talk about what um, what a bathroom, what a public bathroom would look like conceptually or what we're thinking of and some of the needs. Um, and I would hope that a discussion that we would have would lead to direction for the staff to come back to maybe flesh out some of the options that we would talk about or to determine whether we even want the staff to do those type of things. So, you know, we've, I think we've, we've talked before about the need for a public bathroom and what it would serve, which would be a mixture of, you know, people that don't have facilities because of lack of uh, a home or uh, visitors to the city um, or other individuals that find themselves in Montpelier in need of public facilities in part because what we've experienced in the past year is uh, a lot of uh, closure of what we had normally relied upon in the web of public and private restrooms uh, for visitors to the city or residents of the city or anyone in the city that found themselves in need of, of those, those facilities. Um, so I did a little bit of research in coming into this and I guess one of the things that I, I feel strongly about is that um, you know, this is some an opportunity in, in a lot of ways to create um, 
a piece of public architecture um, that has a high functionality, obviously, but you know, we shouldn't simply think of this in the terms of like something a little bit more elaborate than the uh, Porta Johns that are currently outside of City Hall. We should be really thinking about this as uh, a potential public structure um, <clears throat> that could be uh, a benefit or a landmark to the city um, and one that is going to have a high usage. And so, um, What's interesting is Tokyo is going through a similar type of, of um, reevaluation in some of their parks. So they've created um, public facilities that are all glass facilities. And the NPR did a great piece on this. And uh, what it is is they're all glass, so you can drive by or walk by and see into the bathrooms completely. But as soon as you go in and you lock the door, it frosts up and becomes private. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's a really, that kind of architectural uniqueness or quality and, and, and they're lit, they're like little lanterns, the, the buildings themselves, they have sort of embedded lighting that, so that they're constantly lit and they, you know, they look like little lanterns, um, I'll, um, you know, uh, restroom size lanterns, uh, but this, I think the idea of something something architecturally interesting, creative, um, that would be easy to maintain, but would provide these essential facilities. And I think, you know, really it's a, it's a challenge of whether, you know, and, and this seems to be something, at least as far as I can see, seems to be something we have a need for in, in this city. Um, you know, we talked about this last time, but I know, I know I've talked with other people around town and received some emails uh, from constituents and others saying, yeah, this, there is a need for this in, in the downtown right now. Um, and so, you know, I, I was thinking about different places to, to locate this and where we would go. And what one spot that actually, uh, I'll start off this conversation. I don't mean to take this conversation too far down the road into specifics, but it strikes me that one particular location, um, that might be a possibility is, the city owns a small lot across from the mobile station at the corner of um, Main Street, where it turns into Northfield Street, and Memorial Drive, where it turns into Berlin Street. Used to be a gas station a long time ago. It's at the it's at the bottom of the um, the walking path up to National Life, but it's a it's a small little lot, but it's close enough to downtown that somebody who is in downtown could easily go to it. But it also doesn't you know forfeit any of the uh, real estate that, you know, is at a premium in, in the downtown of Montpelier. Um, as well, I think it, you know, it, it does sort of push this out a little bit so that it's, um, you know, it's, it's at a, I think at a highly visible location, which, you know, might help with keeping it clean or, you know, the, the use of it, um, which all seem to be ideas that I think we, we should be considering. Um, but I think this is an idea that, you know, it's time has come um, and it's worth worth considering. So that's sort of my introduction to why I think this is worthy of consideration. And I guess I would finally add that, you know, I don't see this happening. Obviously, we don't have the money in the current budget. We are just beginning to think about the next year's budget. Um, and so I would, you know, it's not as if we have a pile of money laying around, but I would see this as a priority that ultimately we would set money aside in the future budget to do this construction, that this is a, a civic project that merits that type of um, budget allocation um, in the upcoming budgets. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, um, I just want to uh, echo the sentiment that I think this is certainly, it's clearly needed and um, it it's worth thinking about at what point, um, you know, basically like, you know, do we think about this for, for this coming budget or, you know, how can we be creative about thinking about, you know, either creating such a structure or the um, maintenance of, of such a structure. So um, I, have, I have more comments to make, but I'm gonna hold off on them for now. Um, curious for um, other people's thoughts and um, also comments from the public. 
I'm, I'm ready anytime you are. <laughs> Go for it, Stephen. Uh, I, I think that it, I want to remind you that it's been over a year and a half that I've been bringing this issue to your attention. And for it to appear on the agenda as if it's just, you know, Dan's bringing it forth. Dan's bringing forth a long-term expensive option for, you know, a city architectural project. Well, I don't dispute the value of that. There are urgent needs. If you go back and look at the charge that you gave the homelessness task force, they haven't fulfilled any of that. And one of the first priority things that I argued before I resigned is an inventory of bathroom options for the folks. But now I'm talking to people even today who take their kids to the state house lawn and the porta potties are locked. You know, you're, nobody's going to walk from the state house lawn over to the mobile station to be, you know, uh, and this is a, this is an emergency. This is a health emergency. You've got piles of human waste uh, in many places around the city and y'all keep ignoring that. So I think you need to do an immediate inventory, charge the staff with it because the task force isn't going to do it. Inventory of all possible publicly accessible bathrooms and find use, find the money to pay for their maintenance or disposal for the paper, uh, consumables, and a cleaning service. But, you know, the two outhouses just don't cut it. And City Hall, Chief Fakos agreed that my suggestion that City Hall rear doors be equipped with electric locks and a video camera, which can be done dirt cheap, and be made available 24-7, even if you have to get buzzed in from the police dispatcher. That That's a viable, reachable thing that could be done in a week. But apparently, y'all took your five-minute break, and I suspect most of you relieved yourselves, ignorant of all the folks that are out there that don't have any place to do so. And I think it's a it's a travesty of irresponsibility that we're facing here, uh, a real disconnect between, you know, public service, both for tourists and for people without housing. I have more ideas, but I'm going to give other people a chance to weigh in on how you, you need to prioritize this and, and take some immediate action. Thank you, Stephen. Your your point is well taken that, you know, this is uh, it's a problem now. And we, you know, uh, we've sort of started that. Well, first of all, that you've been bringing it up. Um, thank you. Yes. And um, also, uh, you know, that that we, you know, have been, we've sort of started here with uh, thinking about a long-term solution, but also considering some short-term solutions, I think also um, warrants discussion as well. Um, so yeah, let's, let's keep both of those uh, in mind. Um, other, other thoughts or comments? Um, uh, Donna, then Jack. Uh, I do like the idea of thinking immediately, but I also like Dan bringing in some broader ideas. And I think it behooves us to do that because out of respect for all the people using it. And it also is an invitation into our community. I mean, there's lots of ways to even maybe get grants. We think of it as a little bit broader than just a substitute for a porty pot. But uh, Stephen's right, we do need to do something. I would like to see the staff bring us back some ideas, both on funding, locations, and types. So thank you for bringing it up, Dan. Yep. Uh, Jack and then Connor. I agree. This this is a real need. There's an immediate need. There's a long term need. I think uh, you know. I go on vacations places. Well, summers when I am able to go on vacation, <laughs> I go to places where like on Martha's Vineyard where they have public bathrooms in each of the uh, of the towns where uh, tourists congregate, and I think that's uh, of value for the city of Montpelier. Uh, also, of value for people. Uh, who are residents, uh, whether they're housed or not, who who need the facilities while they're downtown. So I think we should uh, figure out how to find the money for probably for additional portable uh, toilets, as well as uh, figure out the uh, feasibility and budget for the uh, access to indoor facilities in City Hall and proceed with the uh, trying to figure out what the best way to meet 
the need long term is, which probably involves building something somewhere. And that's all I've got. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, well, I wonder if it might be worth bringing parks into the conversation because um, it, it strikes me they kind of do it right. You know, if you go up to Hubbard Park, you got the you actually have the facilities up there with the sawdust, but it's very clean. It's like, yeah, almost extravagant, a couple of them. So, you know, it's not, it's, it would be out of the floodplain to be close to downtown, but sort of the entrance of, uh, you know, the path up to the, you know, up to, up to the castle there. Um, I wonder if that's maybe just something worth looking at there and like an Alex brain, because I, I don't I don't know if those things break the bank. I, I think they could be constructed maybe even in-house or something. Um, and I'm not saying it's a solution, but, you know, a good number of uh, homeless folks um, would be spending time around there too. So that might be a benefit for, for them as well. So something to think about. So um, a couple of pieces, and I just want to bring up about this. So one is, uh, you know, there's a consideration of the infrastructure itself, um, which would be expensive. But then um, there's there would be the ongoing maintenance costs of this. And I imagine that if the city was going to take on the running of a uh, public bathroom, uh, either it's a contracted service or it's an FTE or part of an FTE. Um, and so with with that possibility, um, I feel like it's it's worth looking at existing infrastructure, um, you know, whether that's City Hall or whether that's, you know, reworking, um, you know, the arrangement with the transit center. Um, you know, they're supposed to be running that facility, but if it was us who were paying for it to, for the bathrooms to be open and clean, then, you know, that's a separate, separate situation. I, I don't know how Re reworkable that is it might not be I don't know but just you know looking at existing structures knowing that um, if we go down that this road there will be a, an ongoing maintenance cost anyway um, and so and just the way that I picture this going um, is that uh, that this may be one of the things that I mean if, if people are are interested in it, uh, that this is something that goes on to the um, list of options uh, for our upcoming budget conversation. Um, I mean, maybe it's, it, it might be too soon for this. I and mean, we do have, I think some, uh, tricky is probably not quite the right word, but we, it, you know, it, it may be a difficult uh, budget year uh, anyway, just because things are so unpredictable uh, right now, but keeping that in mind, you know, if this is something that's on on the table anyway, um, I think that would make sense to me. Um, curious for others' opinions about that. Uh, I, I, seeing a thumbs up from Jack uh, and Connor and Donna um, and Lauren, uh, Dan, did you have a comment? No, I'll just add the thumbs up. Oh, okay. Um, you know, there is one other thing that I wanted to bring up. Um, I realize this is not exact, this is not totally related, but um, I have been getting lots of complaints about garbage uh, around um, the pocket park that is on the bike path behind the DMV. Um, I, it's, so I've, I've actually been having uh, conversations, because I, I bike there, past there, um, especially now that school is starting, uh, just about every day. And so I've been having conversations with people hanging out there uh, and with uh, various other organizations that um, are involved with that spot. Um, just thinking about like, you know, this, this spot is really hard to maintain um, just trash wise. And uh, so it seems like there may need to be a, a new plan for that location and thinking about rehoming that structure um and so just i don't know that that needs to be um i don't think there's anything to decide on uh as a council with that necessarily unless i mean if you have feedback about that idea or you have objections to that idea certainly like let me know or staff know but um otherwise um you know we, i think we're, we'll be exploring um just moving that structure um so anyway, I just want to put that out there. But anyway, from the conversations that I had with folks, 
you know, it, it sounded like, you know, if it, if it went away or, or not went away, but like, if it was moved, that would be okay. Um, but, uh, but we, you know, but also, you know, even unprompted, uh, the, the conversation went towards, you know, what we really do need is public restrooms. Um, and so that, that was, it was very helpful. It was very enlightening. Um, Donna, go ahead. So are you thinking of removing it because there's a problem with it versus trying to work on the problem? It's such a neat little feature for the shared path. It, I'd hate to see it gone, that we can't try to work together to have it more presentable all the time. Yeah, it's, we've tried. It's like the city taking away city benches because people sit on them, they don't want to sit on them. So well, I there may be a, a way to revision how that space uh, could be used potentially. So, um, is is that revisiting just going to happen, or are we going to talk about it as a group? Or? Well, that's a good question. Would you Would you like to talk about it as a group? I mean, I'm not. Sh I, I don't. I'd have like to be involved. Maybe the council doesn't, but I would. Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts on that? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Uh, okay. Oh. Uh, Dan and then Steve. Well, I guess, I, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of the idea of, of repurposing it. I, I think that the, as it exists right now, it's, it's not quite the right fit. And, and I agree that this is something where, um, you know, it's being, it, you know, it's sort of a Sisyphean struggle to keep the, um, the, the park clean. And it's also at a very sort of awkward junction of the bike path and that there are gates on either side. It's a bit of a narrow um, turn through. And if there are people occupying the park as a, and crossing the path, it can feel a little bit tight. Um, and so I think it would be, you know, I think it's, it's a great structure. It would be better served in a different location, e even possibly along the bike path, but that particular corner. Um, and, and I just don't see, you know, I, and this is just anecdotal, is I don't see the summer people there hanging out at, and enjoying it. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that have used the site for, um, you know, either I, I've seen people sleeping there, I've seen people, um, you know, uh, I've seen a lot of trash there. Um, you know, I, it doesn't feel like it's become the sort of uh, way station for community gatherings or, or that sort, I think it would be better served somewhere else. And especially, you know, given that, you know, what's really, what's really happening and we're seeing, you know, where people use it for trash or um, uh, an impromptu bathroom, you know, it would be better served by building a bathroom and providing those facilities that people need um, and putting this in a different location. Yeah. Um, Stephen, did you want to comment on this? Yeah. Yeah, I do because I, I reported the the accumulating trash last week, and and it it was it needed to be the trash needed to be picked up Friday all around town, and instead uh, it didn't get picked up until Tuesday, and it was blown in and, and it, it, the remains of the blown around trash is around. I did notice that after you and your husband rode by, somebody came in and, and removed the three barrels worth of trash, uh, including the one outside of a barrel. So the, that pocket park did get picked up. The problem, this is integrally related to the homelessness and the ba public bathrooms. But we need to engage with the merchants because the merchants have as much interest in visitors feeling like this is a town where they can come and feel comfortable walking around and still, instead of feeling in pain walking around. And that, that's a problem. We, we, we're gonna need to immediately negotiate bathrooms from existing facilities down near the state house, which used to be served by the tourist visitor center, the state visitor center, uh, near Bethany church, that information booth, there's plumbing available there. That information booth could be a fine place for uh, a public restroom. Uh, outhouses do not cut it. They don't, they don't maintain well. They overflow, there's no hand washing facilities. We are in a pandemic. Uh, city center was at one point w willing to consider keeping those open if the city paid for the consumables, but they have now rejected that entirely. 
uh, I think Upper Elm Street on the south end of Elm Street, one of those properties, one of those small little businesses could be converted into a very accessible and conveniently centrally located public restroom. I, this is an area that needs somebody like Ward Joyce to come back to you in two weeks with a uh, plan for what can be done within the next month and what's going to take six months and, and tens of thousands of dollars. I think you need to get real serious about this. This is a human rights issue. This is a, you know, a racism issue. This is a quality of life issue. And you're treating it like it's, a, you know, an optional icing on the cake project, you know? Mm. That's enough. Thank you. Yeah, no, your point is well taken. Um, I yeah. did try to recruit, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. I did try to recruit uh, the manager uh, George of Shaw's. He was willing to call in, but I didn't get the agenda to him before he left today with the call-in number. He he has some relevant experience with trying to manage a public restroom there where the toilets get clogged by people flushing needles down, which then catch, you know, waste paper and, you know, one simple solution, you know, city bathrooms have a needle uh, receptacle, you know, okay. his does not. So that, there's an area for collaboration which we should explore urgently uh, because everyone benefits and somebody needs to look at the liability, shared liability issues, et cetera. But I think that there there are solutions available uh, that should not be postponed for months. Yeah, and and that, you know, would cost some money but wouldn't be potentially lots of money. Um, so, um, other thoughts on, um, on this topic here, team, do we need to, um, well, actually I'd love to hear from, from Bill, uh, how are you hearing us? Do you need a directive from us? Uh, yeah. How are you, how are you feeling about all this? Uh, well, I mean, we have the same. You know, I think Stevens articulated really well that the biggest obstacle for most of the solutions is COVID. You know, I don't think anybody wants or is allowed to have public people come in and using their bathrooms. I think that's that's really an exact, you know, that's the main reason why the city hall was closed off. I think that's why, the, you know, we had the police open 24-7. Um, so we get it. And um, so, you know, I've written down what everyone said. We, you know, when we debrief our this meeting tomorrow, we will put our heads together and, and about all these topics and figure out uh, some suggestions. Uh, and you know, we'll try to do as much to private people, but I, I you know, it's a, it's a, that's a great idea. I, I think Stephen's right on the money there, but I also know if I'm a private business and my, you know, you're already having to be restricted about who you're letting in and the rules that you have and the cleanliness and all that. So how, you know, how do you balance that? Sure. Um, don't know. Madam Mayor, the, the fact that we're allowing, they gave, the city gave keys to the construction guys on Taylor Street that they can use the brand new restrooms while all the homeless folks sit out there and just resent the hell out of it is, is an example of how uh, uh, blind we are to this issue. Mm. So just thinking about um, the, just the, how we follow up on this, um, I, is the is the next council meeting um, too soon for for initial thoughts, feedback, or um, we'll see. I mean, we'll, this is important, so yeah, okay. And and I do like you know even in thinking of the the long term, um, Dan and I had actually talked about the the prospect of uh, some kind of a design competition. You know, whether it's an architectural, if we decide to go forward with. Um, constructing something new, you know, are there creative ways to, um, to leverage, you know, something that would be an asset to the city, um, you know, beyond, beyond its function. Um, but, uh, you know, be creative as well. Um, but that, that's probably further down the line than, than where we're at right now. Um, Jay, go ahead. Just a quick question. I just want to understand sort of the, responsibility, accountability around the Girton Pocket Park. Like who's who manages that if we were to consider relocating it, 
um, what, what's that process look like? And, and is that something that we need to have a conversation with at the council level? Well, the city owns the park. Um, so since it's a pocket park, it's presumably under the auspices of the parks commission. Um, but technically the, the parks manages it. Um, we'll be having, like I said, we'll, we'll debrief this issue tomorrow morning. We'll see what Alec has to say. Uh, I know he's been tipped off that this is a concern and they may have some ideas about what they'd like to do with it. Um, obviously I think as a courtesy, we should, you know, talk to Paige Curtin and, um, but, um, I think it's also has been a constant source of, uh, issues with, with garbage and, um, just conflicts there. So if there's a better use for that space and for that structure, then I think you know, the time might be now. And as far as I am aware, um, just where we're at with that was uh, checking in with uh, city staff about if, if there was a, a different location where that might work, where might that be? Um, so I think we were still just, uh, just thinking through it and uh, no solid plan uh, about that yet, uh, but we can, if folks are interested, we could, we can bring that back, um, for discussion or I can, you know, bring it up as, as part of the reports or whatever, whatever makes sense to folks. Um, Mayor, can I give Joe one minute to one minute on the pocket park? The sure. pocket park is not the problem there. It took me six months to get public works to put trash receptacles there. And I had to recruit people to climb down the bank and clean up the garbage that it accumulated. So the, the park, the problem, perceived problems or the projected problems with the park are problems of neglecting warming spaces and cooling spaces for the homeless. That's the only place where they congregate and get their meals. And to ignore that fact and say, oh, we're just going to take your meal site away is just, it's just absurd. You know, it, we're really, it's disconnected. So mm -hmm. I, I have a lot more to say, but at another time. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Bill. Steven, can you tell me more about the meals? So the meals are delivered, uh, they're coordinated by, by Dawn and by the food providers that uh, Skinny Pancake and, and uh, Capstone. And that's the place where a dozen meals get delivered uh, at least once a day. And the folks are picking them up there. They're putting a cooler and the coolers have sometimes been damaged and replaced. Uh, the cooler there now hasn't been cleaned in weeks. And yet there was fresh, 12 packets of fresh beef stroganoff in it, you know, yesterday when I went out there to check. Casey was the only one there at the time. But my point is that if, if you want to make enforcement i mean the pocket park especially during the winter months could potentially be moved up into the confluence little postage stamp park it still needs to be there as a place but there the police could monitor it more for uh alcohol abuse i i don't i'm not trying to run anybody off i, I think that until we in another way is not going to handle it just like the shelter doesn't handle everybody we, we've got to write a plan. You should have insisted upon a plan being written to handle both the people that fit into that system and the people that don't, including meals. I, I'm the only one publicizing where the meals are, and it's absurd. So you've got a planning process that's integrated with tourists, bathrooms, and homeless that needs to be well integrated, and you've neglected it for a solid year now. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um... So at this point, I don't know that we, uh, if, uh, if Bill, you're going to get back to us with some recommendations, mm -hmm. um, then I don't know that we need that there's any other action to take on this item right now. Um, any further comments uh, about this team? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so to be continued. And uh, so the next item is uh, the COVID update. Uh, so for this, uh, is that Cameron? Sure is. All right. So um, this one's a little bit more brief. There hasn't been a whole lot of movement in the state. Um, there has been some changes this uh, month to some of his work smart or work safe, stay safe order. Um, 
uh, that included some guidance for rec departments um, that didn't necessitate us making any changes to our proposed programs. We were already well within the guidelines that they proposed. So our programming, which includes soccer right now, is moving forward as planned. Uh, the Vermont uh, Department of Tourism and Marketing is looking for businesses to help quantify the impact of COVID-19. So they have a survey, I included that link. They requested um, information by this Friday from businesses. Um, the governor also announced that Kinney Drugs has partnered with the state and 11 of their locations will be made into COVID-19 testing sites. And details of that and making um, signing up to make an appointment can be found on the health department's website. And then the state also launched the hashtag buy local Vermont program. Um, you can sign up through, um, I believe it's thinkvermont.com for a $30 voucher to participating local businesses. I think they probably are out by now, but they did say that they were looking at further options, but that was announced this week. Um, general city updates, um, you know, we're still open on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We are having a um, Red Cross event tomorrow that they are running by appointment only. Just so you know, if you do decide to come into City Hall tomorrow at any point, there will be a larger than normal amount of folks in the building, but they are, um, they do have a COVID-19 plan and they're only accepting blood donations on appointment. Um, we also made a change in parking as reviewed in the parking plan that you had looked at and approved before. We will be turning on our meters in the parking lots and accept and enforcing permit parking starting on the 15th this month. Um, we're also still talking to the CAN neighborhoods and Mont Montpelier Mutual Aid. Another way has also begun to give us community meal information and we've been including that in our weekly reports. Um, another way on Berry Street does have a Friday night dinner and a Wednesday breakfast that they are now giving us information about. Regarding our communications, we've had an uptick in interactions. We're averaging almost 2,000 interactions with all of our posts around COVID-19. Um, the most uh, impactful one from this past few weeks was about the Park Avenue closing and the street chain, the traffic changes there, which reached over 4,000 folks in uh, our network. So that was my brief COVID-19 update for the last two weeks. Do you guys have any questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Cameron. Just real quick. One thing is the um, uh, the thirty dollars gift cards like ran out within about half an hour. I don't know right. if they're going to issue any more, but maybe they will. Um, okay. The other thing is, and I, I didn't, I saw the link, but I didn't follow the link to the Department of Tourism that is looking for bit data from local businesses. But I, I just wanted to let you know, and maybe you could connect the dots here, that Montpelier Live has been doing monthly surveys to all the downtown businesses in terms of wh where their revenues are year over year, you know, this year compared to past years. Are they breaking even? How many people are they employing now relative to last year's? They've done it for May, June, July, and the August one is just about to go out. So that there's a lot of data available. So may, you might be able to connect with Dan to share that information. It's it's already there. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so on to in-person meetings. Uh, yeah, is this camera? Yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, sort of wearing the COVID um, information hat right now. Um, I gave a couple different proposals um, to you about what um, a meeting in person might could look like. I do want to go over the survey results that I also included really briefly. I know that we did not have a huge amount of responses to that, so it's not a statistically significant by any means, but um, it is the people who cared enough to reach out and say something. So we had a lot of really responses, pro and con, for returning in person. 
Um, out of the, I mean, only 19 folks responded to any of our um, outreach, which was done on Front Porch Forum, our Facebook page, and um, uh, I think that was where we, we put out the information, but we also created an online survey that people could use anonymously if they weren't interested in putting their name on that. But the majority overwhelmingly said they were not interested um, and had a lot of reasons as to why, a lot of health and safety reasons. People also mentioned that they found Zoom convenient to them and that they were able to participate more as they were able to watch it from home in a more convenient way for them. I think a lot of folks are now discovering that you guys are streaming on YouTube and maybe not have known that before um, and that they're able to just log in to Zoom if they have uh, something they want to say when they see it on TV versus having to get in a car and drive down to City Hall. So there's a lot of um, interest there, I think, around this sort of Zoom platform. Um, my recommendation and staff's recommendation is not to um, continue in-person meetings and to continue on Zoom until um, there is a, even until there's a vaccine, until people are comfortable being in close proximity to each other, if only because of the financial um, impacts of that space. Um, in order to safely keep all of y'all uh, six feet apart, we'll need to install plexiglass um, between you. There would still need to be a mask mandate inside the building. Um, and the windows would need to be probably opened. And we don't have a large capacity in that room. Um, if people are standing, uh, 32 people can be in that room, including y'all, but that's standing room. And that's, that's not um, uh, an accessible way to have folks attend a meeting. So um, there's a lot to consider when you're making this decision. We will make it work whatever way you want to make it work. Um, the reason I'm mentioning financial costs is that all of the grants that we were eligible for to be reimbursed, the deadlines have already passed. And this is not something that we included um, as we did not have any extra capital to really put into that at this moment. So um, those times are past. So we need to out of pocket cost putting up plexiglass. Um, so um, I put a couple different proposals in front of you. Um, there's a combination of socially distanced meeting in person and with a Zoom component. I did test that out a few times. Um, it's not ideal because you can't get the full room in the picture. So folks would be cut out of that Zoom space. Um, we would need staff to monitor that and that's fine. I would do that no problem. Um, I don't doubt that we could make it work, but I do doubt that it would be the most successful option. Um, we talked about plexiglass dividers and moving folks around the room just to make sure that people um, were appropriately spaced. Um, masks would need to be worn the entire time, even if you were appropriately spaced. The CDC guidelines say if you're around somebody for more than 15 minutes, that's really unacceptable amounts of risk in their eyes, and it is an increased risk of um, transmission. So that's the information that I gathered, and I did have a few proposals. Um, it's honestly, we're here to do uh, whatever you feel is best. So. Thoughts. I, I actually don't have strong feelings about this. Connor, and then and Lauren. I, 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 I'll back off a bit. I was one of the ones. I, I bloody I hate the Zoom meetings. Maybe it's because my head is too big. I can barely fit in the frame. But um, I, I do think it detracts from some of the work we do being on Zoom. You know, I know when Dan like taps the table three times, it means vote a certain way and stuff. But. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I missed the person to person contact, but you know, I think even though the survey had a pretty small sample size, we're probably entering kind of uncertain times with school being back in session and UVM coming. So maybe revisit it in a bit, but I'm okay sticking with Zoom for now. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Uh, yeah, I was going to say similar i mean i much 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 prefer to be in person um but just the the challenges with making it work and, and the risk and you know if i felt like it really was a, a much more accessible um scenario for the public it might be worth it but i think this is actually um you know being able to access it from 
people's homes who have that via phone is probably more accessible in many ways than having to get to city hall. So I think holding off, you know, they were just out today or in the last couple of days with projections for, uh, for the next month or two in Vermont, and they're anticipating a little spike as school and everything. So it seems like the wrong time to be undertaking this, unfortunately. I mean, we can keep an eye on it and keep the conversation, um, you know, seeing what options and what creative um, things other cities might be doing and stuff. But I think for now, it doesn't seem worth it. I will put out there that I, I thought of a, a different uh, configuration, which is to say that um, it, it would, like, what if we were in person, uh, but we, instead of trying to put us all on Zoom in terms of, like, one Zoom, um, seeing the whole room, because we all bring our laptops, our devices anyway. Um, so what if we all brought our laptops to the council chambers and then did this, you know, each individually. So we would all be in the same room, but with our own, our own pictures. Um, and I don't know. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm Is not so sold on that. Zoom we meeting? have to do it, <laughs> but what's that, Donna? Is that a live Zoom meeting? Yeah, like a live Zoom meeting so that like the public would still participate in this, in, in this same way, but we would be in the in the room together, um, sort of a, it's a different way to think of a hybrid, but I, there's, I don't know, there's other disadvantages to that. So, um, in case okay, so anyone have any strong feelings about, or actually any, any other thoughts really? Are you taking public comment? Um, yes, go ahead, Steven. And then Donna. Yeah. I, I I really like, I hadn't even considered the, the model that you just proposed of the hybrid Zoom meeting. Uh, there are, I tried to get folks uh, around town who are most affected by the bathroom conversation. Many don't have phones. There's no place for them to go and find a computer uh, to, to participate in this meeting and be heard. You know, you, you eliminate there's some people, there's broadband issues. Uh, I'm frequently have telephone capacity, but not broadband capacity. So I think you, and, and then presentations of, a, of anything like parking maps, et cetera, those cannot adequately be done on Zoom. So I, ORCA can capture those from a city council meeting uh, full screen properly, but I think you need to, uh, make efforts and progress, and I earlier suggested better ventilation in that room uh, with heat recovery. Uh, so I would encourage you, there may be more money available if you make it a, a telecommunications experiment um, for participation. Uh, Zoom, I put, particularly won't put that software on my computer because the encryption keys are passed off a server in China. And that's just not an acceptable security risk for me. So uh, there's my two cents on that topic. I would encourage you to resume uh, socially distanced council meetings in a hybrid manner. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, Donna. Um, I definitely prefer Zoom than the mask and the setup. I think we have to be the example of the new norm. I think it's a year to two years if not longer, if the vaccine, vaccination comes out, if it all happens and gets distributed. But meanwhile, I think if we can accept this as our norm is how do we make this better? I guess that was the piece I was trying to bring up with looking at not only holding our meetings with a different maybe approach, but also Stephen's right. This is not perfect for open meeting law at all, but we're still trying and we need to keep working on ways where people can, maybe can access electronics. And we also need to, I think for us as a council, need to add a social component. So we're having some, what I call, you know, really casual social conversation. And whether that's once a month, we meet 30 minutes early and eat together at our prospective homes and talk about our dogs or cats and whatever. I think that would be really good for us as a group. And maybe we can get Connor to smile more. 
<laughs> but anyway, I just think we have to accept it's 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 going to be a long hoe, people. That's all. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Um, I I do wonder just the comment about you know looking at maps and things. I mean, even the winter parking conversation. You know, trying to either set up maybe in council chambers like maps that people could go have a certain window that obviously you know it takes some staffing capacity to um you know even if the conversation was not happening then like the public hearing but an opportunity to so if people do want to go look at bigger maps that might be easier to digest than um than on zoom or people who don't have access to um to good internet which obviously is common around here um so, so maybe it's hybrid also of how we're trying to just get the key materials that will be discussed so people have different ways to look at it and process it. And then even if you are then calling into a meeting or Zooming into a meeting, um, you know, having that kind of access. It's a really great point. And we can definitely work on getting printouts and put them in the hallway. Again, we're open all day business hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So the public is welcome to come in and, you know, we can put those out for folks, not a problem. I'll just stay in here too. I mean, staff, obviously, we would much prefer in person meetings as well for all the reasons everybody else does. Um, and recognize the limitations of this, this uh, situation. We're equally concerned by, you know, a, a space, you know, for, for maybe a lot, you know, what do we say, 32 people? There's nine, 10, 11 of us probably with the city in any given meeting, if not more. So we're, you know, we'd have a cap at 20 members of the public for most meetings, maybe less, depending on staff or consultants or anybody that needed to come. And, you know, from the average meeting, maybe that's not a problem for, but for the issue, for the exact meetings we're talking about where there's a lot of interest, we'd, you know, we would be, sorry, we're at capacity, we can't let you in. And so we're, you know, we're, yes, I think we need to figure this out. I know this is what this has sort of been the default that folks all over the country are going to. And um, even even places that have town meetings, you know, actual town meetings have figured out how to do this on Zoom. But, it, you know, they just set up a thing and people, people are calling in and doing it with, you know, hundreds of people. So uh, it's not, it's definitely an imperfect system, but, you know, so is, you know, we used to get complaints about meetings that it was late at night and people couldn't come out or they had childcare or it was, the weather was bad. Yeah. Uh, they couldn't make it. Um, you know, it is, it's tough. Yeah. No, so, the, uh, may I again, Mayor? Uh, um, the, 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 and then Jay. The media, the media quality uh, suffers. If, if, if you are the council in a room spaced, ORCA can be capturing full resolution audio and video. That's important. We're forfeiting this entire era uh, of transcription. Automated transcription will be impossible from the audio quality of these recordings. And many people who are have damaged or limited hearing can't even understand the conversation over these Zoom calls. So we there are uh, there are costs, but there are also benefits to pushing for more than better than what we're doing right now. Mm, fair enough. Um, thank you. Uh, Jay. Um, thanks. I, Bill and Cameron, I'm, I wondered if you, in thinking about uh, alternatives for these meetings, if you considered other space other than the, than the chambers. Um, is there somewhere else in town or is there somewhere nearby? Could we go upstairs? Could we go somewhere where we could space, um, where we could have more room um, to, to all be present? It, it, the bottom line is I, I don't fall on one side of the fence with either, the, either side. I, I'm very conflicted. There's a part of me that says that I, you know, I really appreciate the increased accessibility for people to engage in the meeting when it's most important to them. I also hear um, what you know what hear what Stephen's saying about you know being able to have access to broadband and to be able to see presentations. Um, and I do also appreciate that it's a new norm, but at the same time, you know, I, I you know my 
I take my nine-year-old to school and expect him to wear a mask for four and a half hours, five days a week, and and my 12-year-old and my 15-year-old. And so it, it, we, we, you know, the state said to the school districts, hey, you got to figure this out. And they've done the best they've could. And given the circumstances they had, and I wonder, you know, I wonder if we could rethink the cir- our circumstances. Could we be somewhere where we could have more space? We could be present. But, you know, um, like the mayor mentioned, the possibility of you just engaging via a laptop and in person so that we can find a balance between accessibility and also being there so that we can interact and, and have those, inter, you know, inter, have those conversations where we're, um, where we're together in one room and it's, it's, you know, it's increased access on, on both fronts. Um, I'm not arguing one side or the other. I'm just sort of trying to sort of think out loud here about what, what we're, what could we come up with some more creative solutions? Could we think about different ways to be able to approach this understanding, hearing from everybody and knowing what's important for us as a council and also to the public. Those are all great ideas. So we thought briefly about upstairs, we could look at it some more. And I think, you know, the main objection there, honestly, was, was number one, the reliability of the elevator, but assuming the elevator's working. But, um, you know, it's a double-edged sword, right? So Stephen appropriately raised the ORCA issue. All the ORCA equipment is in the council chamber. I don't know what it would be involved in, you know, moving that, but I would imagine it would be, you know, maybe it's worth it. Um, we thought about other locations, um, you know, the school has an auditorium in the elementary school and in the high school, but under, for understandable reasons, the school doesn't want other people in there. I mean, it's not faulting them, but those are kind of off limits. You know, most, most places don't want us going in. So our options as a city are really pretty limited it's to this building. So, uh, you know, upstairs is the only bigger space that we have, and, and maybe that is something we can at least try to tweak, you know, look at technologically and see how that works. You know, maybe it is something like what the mayor suggested where we're in person with laptop on Zoom and, you know, maybe we could have a limited number of public in there, but it would have to be, you know, I don't know, first cut, you know, sign up, take 10 reservations or something and that's it. Nobody beyond that. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Jack, go ahead. And then I have a a follow-up thought. I'm not really pushing for doing meetings in person, although I, uh, like everyone else, I, uh, I prefer that personal interaction. Um, one thought that occurred to me as I was reading through the descriptions of uh, how we might set the room up is whether we could consider disregarding the dais completely and having the entire council lined up lengthwise along one of the uh, one of the long walls in the combined council chambers and uh, memorial room and uh, that would potentially give us enough uh, separation to do that um, I could do that but it, it, I just want to say it wouldn't change the capacity of the room in any way right I, I, I get that but it would be seems like it might be a more workable way to get everybody visible, not having, you know, people at the tables, either with the back to the other members of the council or the back to the public. I don't know. The other thought that occurred to me with regard to the mayor's proposal is that the, uh, from my experience of doing, uh, trials in courtrooms with, uh, video conference is that once we once there's more than one electronic device running the program at the same time it seems like we always get um, feedback or other interference problems which we typically get resolved but it's uh, you know if everyone has their speakers on you got to have your speaker turned off or or where's the mic what mic is going to be on to pick everybody up and so i think it's 
it, I'm not saying it's insurmountable, but it's a challenge. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, just to follow up, just thinking about like if we use the uh, area upstairs, uh, just thinking about the Orca Media challenges. I mean, they're they're on our Zoom call now, um, and presumably they, if we were going to do something similar in a, a hybrid model, they could. It would at least be as well. They could potentially engage in the same way. Anyway, just making a note of that. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more complicated with Orca because they do have cables and lines running into the room um, that I don't know if they could easily be restrung up into the auditorium uh, area and to run the cameras. And of course, the cameras are fixed cameras uh, in the council chambers. Um, but it strikes me that there may be um, something worth looking at in the sense of creating a public location um, for attending these meetings, which is, I'm comfortable staying on Zoom. It's not my preferred medium. Um, I'm a three-dimensional guy. I prefer to be seen in person. Um, but at the same time, um, this is the safest option. And just as I send my kids off to school, you know, if there was another really good option that would satisfy all of their their needs, you know, online that was a little bit safer, I would feel more comfortable doing it. I, I think this hits more of the points, but I think to, to some of the concerns that we're facing as far as the ability to have public um, access the meetings, um, you know, maybe there's should be some consideration to having one sort of hub where um, there is the possibility for, you know, the council chambers to be opened for public to, to watch a city council meeting sort of virtually, putting it up on the big screen, giving them an opportunity to speak through the Zoom, maybe one or two people that would be in staffing in the city council room, you know, and or one of us if we, if we chose to, um, but sort of creating that option with the idea that we default on Zoom, but have a, have a city council option for either the public or a limited number. And maybe I we honestly, oh, sorry, Dan. Oh, no, just go ahead. Uh, I, I honestly feel a little silly for not thinking that one through, but we're both Bill and I are obviously here in the office. We do have a computer set up for Zoom in the council chambers. If we could open it up and limit it to 32 people in that room, the public, I don't, I'm just putting this out there if you guys seem fit, opening it up during council hours so that folks can come in and participate via Zoom that way. Um, they would just have to talk at the computer, wouldn't have to touch any of our equipment. Um, Orca would still be able to film it remotely because I honestly did not speak to them about their comfort in coming in. That's another thing that, you know, is a consideration is they might not feel comfortable coming into a public meeting at this point, and I'm not trying to force that on anyone. Um, but that is something that I at least would love to do to clean that space before and after meetings and clean that equipment for folks so they can use it. Um, and maybe there's a way we could get it projected up on the screen. We can do that. That's super easy. Hmm. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, just one other idea to add to the mix. The uh, legislature is looking at this very scenario right now, and they're going to probably be having in-person meetings in Montpelier somewhere that's already covered by ORCA. So they don't meet at 630 on Wednesday nights. We should probably reach out to the state to see. Maybe there's a room at the state house that's already outfitted for this. Interesting. That's an interesting thought. That'd be kind of fun, also. Um, Lauren, did you have any hand raised? No, okay, just checking. Um, okay, I, I don't know that I feel like we landed anywhere in particular, except for that people are okay with where we're at, or, or we're not, it doesn't sound like we're ready to like jump back in, but it, it, this, this possibility of opening things up to the public um, in a limited way in person. That that was interesting to me, just that creates a, an additional avenue um, insofar as you all feel safe doing that. Um, yeah, well, long as, yeah. Let's kick that around a little bit. You know, those were there's some ideas raised tonight that we didn't think of. So let's, 
Let us play with that for a little bit and get back with suggestions because the, the better, the more we can do, the better. Yep. And so is this something that um, you can follow up with us again about at the next meeting? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Donna. Well, I just really want the staff because my concern is being in that older age group uh, and compromise. I would really be concerned of the staff, especially in the fall, winter, if we start having upticks so that you really need to look at it for your safety, please. Uh, I think it's really important that we not ask you to do something we aren't willing to do ourselves. Yeah, that's fair, that's fair. Thank you. Uh, we will have that in our consideration. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, any further comments on this? Okay, all right. Um, Thanks everybody. I think that is the end of our regular business. So we are on to council reports uh, and we're gonna start with Donna. Okay, I'll be quick. Uh, Lauren and I attended DPW's public hearing on their proposed graveling of Cumming Street and it was just the three of us, <laughs> um, but it was good. Zach did a very good job. I, I also, along with several of you, attended the ice cream social for Can. that was very well done and a lovely yard. And I would hope by next meeting, I would like to bring forth my impression of where the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority Board is and to have you start thinking along the lines in the next few months of appointing those two slots that you have on the board that are empty right now. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Connor. Uh, just best of luck to all the teachers and education support professionals going back to school. It was a uh, like just living down the street from Main Street or uh, Middle. It was, it was nice to see everybody out and about again, uh, but I know that comes with a lot of anxiety. So um, everybody's being very brave and uh, best, best of luck to them as, as this rolls out. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jay. Yeah, I'll just uh, echo Connor and say thank you to teachers and administrators and 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 staff for all their work to to get back starting to school um and uh and that's it for me thankfully no uh no new medical emergencies thanks <laughs> uh dan sure uh I'll, I'll echo donna's concern about the central vermont public safety i actually kim cheney reached out to me um you know expressing some concern that we are down members from montpelier and wanting uh, wanting us to sort of beef up simply because I think they're at a point where they need to make some decisions. It sounds like on, on some of the, uh, RFPs that they've put out and without a full board, it makes it difficult, if not close to impossible. So it's certainly something we really, really need to emphasize and to get people, um, to, to join. And I know, you know, there was actually some pressure about putting it on this agenda but it came in too late but it certainly should be one of the agenda items next week um the only other thing that i think we should really um be aware of is you know i'm hearing some chatter and it sort of reflects the conversation we had last week about the police uh which is the student resource officer and i i know that that concern is continuing and that i would in my mind, it seems to make sense that if there is discussion about that, because that's a joint um, position that works with the school system, but works for the city, is that we should be talking to the school board and there should be sort of one, one conversation with an opportunity for the public to have input, but also sort of control the conversation in a sense of let's make sure everyone has an opportunity to be, to be heard about it. And that's all. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jack. All right. Well, this may be the most boring possible council member report, but uh, I think it's worth starting the discussion now. I was looking at the uh, manager's uh, report of upcoming council meetings and uh, in the months of uh, November and December, we have three weeks <clears throat> in which the uh, our scheduled council meetings are uh, potential conflict with uh, a holiday or adjacent to a holiday because we have uh, Veterans Day the night before Thanksgiving and then on de December 23rd, which of course is Festivus. 
but <laughs> what occurred to me, uh, uh, looking right, we're in a five week month now. So this September is a five week month. So if we were to move all the meetings in October, November, and December forward a week, so it would be the first and third uh, Wednesdays of those three months that would avoid the conflicts with all of the uh, holidays that I mentioned. And I, I know people have scheduled you know, plan their uh, their weeks and months in advance. So I thought it was worth mentioning it now as a way uh, to avoid that. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh is this something, uh, Bill or Cameron, that you can put out some recommendations to us, or should we break out our calendars right now? I kind of don't. It seems like we shouldn't do that right now necessarily, but we could. Sure, we can take a look at whether we need to do all of them or some of them, or. Okay, and uh, so you'll come back to us with some some date recommendations. Sure, and the other, I guess, you know, another question is sometimes. Um, especially with the November and December ones, we've been known to meet on a different night too, like a Monday night or something, if that works, because we certainly wouldn't want to conflict with festivals. <laughs> um, unless we were going to have the feats of strength. <laughs> well, there's also... There's we always have the airing of the grievances. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do. And, and part of my thinking is that if we if we do first and third for all these months, we would never run into the situation of having two weeks in a row of having to do a meeting. So, yeah. Any other thoughts on that from council? There's a preference around that. If not, that's okay. Look at that. We'll throw some ideas in the weekly memo this week. Okay. Uh, great, Lauren. A few quick things. Um, one, I just wanted to note for people that the farmer's market is being moved to 133 State Street next to uh, the tax department building. So look out for that. Hopefully that will be a great uh, great new space for it. Um, so hope people can get out there uh, to enjoy our farmer's market. Um, wanted to note um, and thank Bill and Cameron and the staff for the change in policy with the transparency around the lobbying. I, it's been great to see that coming out and the quick implementation of that um, change. So thanks for making that happen. And it's really interesting and helpful to see what our what our city staff are uh, are testifying on. So thank you for for uh, making that happen. Um, on the policing, just. Um, you know, in case people, I know there's a lot of uh, community interest. And so my understanding is that next meeting will likely have, or in a, in a future meeting, we will have a uh, proposal from staff on um, the next, uh, some next steps around um, a committee as the chief proposed uh, strategic planning and visioning. Um, so that conversation is continuing. You know, Dan raised the school resource officer as one of the issues. And then, um, you know, there are a whole bunch of ideas put out there. Um, by both the chief and community uh, members. So just to let people know those conversations are continuing, that process is continuing. Um, and a lot of work is being done by staff, I know. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that was clear to everyone and stay tuned and they'll, uh, you know, for when that's back on um, an agenda. Um, one other uh, last thing. Um, it's been a while since we've had an update from Montpelier Alive. I know last week we get, you know, Jay gives us great updates as being our liaison there, but wondering if we should get, you know, especially heading into winter when outdoor things are going to be less of an option. Like what's, what are our businesses, you know, needing, you know, how can we as a community be supporting them? Um, so wondering if we should invite Dan back or whoever, uh, group of people uh, to to come um you know give us an update and you know explore what we can be doing um as a city or as community members to help support our, our local businesses i want to throw that out great thank you uh so i just want to give everybody a heads up that um already starting to think about 
the budget process that we will be um, starting in probably more like October, November, probably more like November, but even so, um, we've usually started that process with a survey uh, to see what everybody's priorities are. Um, and I think particularly because this is a some unusual circumstances around planning for the budget, um, we want to start that um, early and uh, think about things in sort of a tiered way, potentially. Uh, so just to, to a heads up to be looking for that probably in the next um, couple of weeks. I, again, I know it's it's early, but I, I'd rather get that out on the earlier side rather than later. Um, so just uh, you know, be looking for that. Um, and then also just want to echo the shout out to uh, to educators who are going back to school <laughs> uh, and as well as as families who are are sending uh, their kids to school um, just thinking about everybody during this time and hoping everyone stays stay safe um, so that is it for me uh john anything nothing absolutely nothing i'm on vacation this is what i look like this awesome <laughs> i'm on martha's vineyard right now so Dang this technology that means I can't get out of being in the meeting, but <laughs> uh, it's too convenient. I didn't even think about that when you popped on. I was just wasn't thinking. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, just a couple of things. One, um, you know, Lauren did mention that we were working on police responses. We were planning on that for the next meeting. Um, got to take stock after this meeting to see what got added to next meeting. Because, you know, I, I, no, and I mean that because I think that's going to, you know, we, if we have some lengthy conversations, whether it's around winter parking or other things, you know, we don't want to go to 11 and not be able to take on a, a weighty subject. So we'll probably take a look at um, what's in the queue, and, and, but it'll certainly be one of the next two meetings because it's, it's timely and we've got to do it, but make sure everything is balanced. Uh, so there's that SRO. Uh, was mentioned um, prior to you know, recently and some of the contact you may have had. Uh, the mayor and I have scheduled a meeting with, uh, along with Cameron and the chief, Chief Pete, uh, with school officials um, this Friday uh, for the express purpose of talking about a joint process so that um, we can talk to them about how, how is this gonna be addressed? How, how will these decisions be made? Um, so that both the city and school are on the same page in terms of how they're communicating in public about how this issue will be deliberated. You know, we'll talk about, I don't know, maybe we'll talk about a joint meeting, who knows what we'll talk about. But our goal is, is not so much to talk about the merits of the SRO as it is how will we together uh, or on parallel tracks consider this issue. So that is on our minds as well. Um, quick question. At the last meeting, there was discussion and a, some apparent enthusiasm for some kind of COVID task force to you know, really be looking at downtown and those kind of issues, but then there was no real conclusion to that. No motion, no sense of, so I, you know, I don't really want to wait to another meeting or, for, or how you want to handle that, but um, I, there seemed to be a sense of urgency and I didn't want to have it past the meeting. So um, if anybody wants to weigh in on that. Bill, are you, are, you talking, I, are you talking about like business development and? Yeah, I think you and Dan had sort of raised it as a key issue, having council and business people and just how we're going to keep things going. And, um, and I had written it down and then it was prompted again when uh, Lauren just mentioned, you know, we haven't heard from my pillar alive. What are the plans? I was like, yeah, gee, we said we were going to going to also get involved. So I don't know if anybody wants yeah. to so, about this or. I think that um, long, long story short is that I think that yes, we'll definitely um, want and need to be involved, but we'll, ha you know, I've had a couple conversations with Dan um, and others. We'll, we'll have those guys take the lead in terms of managing that process, but the city, whether it's council and or a staff member, be part of it. I think ultimately that's going, I think that that's going to be the best 
um, the best approach. So, okay. I mean, it's, it's certainly a, a significant discussion and a much broader discussion, but I, I, this is all just sort of kind of coalesced this afternoon. I wasn't able to communicate with anybody ahead of the meeting. So I that's think that's fine. And I'm meeting with Dan tomorrow. Continue. Yeah. So I'm meeting with Dan tomorrow afternoon. We have a regular meeting. So we'll circle the wagons on this. One. Thank you. And yeah, but I'll, I'll loop you in and we'll, so we're on all on the same page with it. Yeah. Super. Thanks. And then just last thing, um, welcome Mary Smith aboard uh, as our new executive assistant. She started yesterday, so you'll start getting emails and things from her. I think she's going to be great. And uh, I'm really anxious to dig into all the, the details. So we're happy to have her. So if you're in City Hall, safely come in and say hi on Tuesdays or Thursdays. And uh, otherwise, look forward to seeing her name giving you all sorts of instructions about things to do. <laughs> okay. Super. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Um, have a good night. And so I will, without objection, uh, declare this meeting adjourned. Good meeting, right. folks. See you later. Thank you. See you.